6.30, so we will call ourselves to order. If I could ask you to say the pledge with me. Thank you very much. Roll call, please. Eva Henry. Steve Odoricio. Jeff Baker. Here. Elise Jones. Here. David Beacom. Here. Randy Wheelock. Sean Wood. Chrissy Fanganello. Anthony Graves. Here. Kevin Flynn. Here. Roger Partridge. Here. Ron Angles. Libby Zabo. Here. Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Bob Roth, Here. Larry Vidham, Here. David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Here. Ann Justin, Here. Lynn Baca, Here. Tara Radloff, Roger Hudson, George Teal, Tammy Maurer, Here. Catherine Heider, Laura Christman, Here. Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Here. Steve Conklin, Here. Linda Olson, Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Carolyn Scharf. Here. Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey. Here. Scott Norquist, Storm Glore, Jim Dale. Here. Ron Rakowski. Present. Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton. Hello. Dana Gutwine, Jacob LeBure, Jerry Bean, Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod. Here. Jacob Lofgren. Here. Wynn Shaw. Present. Joan Peck. Here. Ashley Stolzman. Here. Connie Sullivan. Dan Greenberg. Colleen Whitlow. Here. Deborah Jerome. Sean Forey. Chris Larson. Jordan Sowers. Julie Mullica. Here. John Dyack. Here. Sally Daigle. Here. Ooh, Rita Dozal. Here. Jessica Sandgren. Here. Herb Atchison. Yes. Bud Starker. Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Here. Bill Van Meter. Here. And we do have a quorum. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is this thing. Not that are here, no. Okay. All right. So we will uh, next agenda item four, a uh, motion to approve the agenda. Have a motion and a second discussion. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Thank you. Agenda item five, we have a presentation from the Olympic Exploratory Committee. We have Mr. Bruce James from the law firm of Brownsteet, Hyatt, Farber, and Trek here. So I will uh, turn the time over to Mr. James. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for allowing some time on your busy agenda to get an update from the Olympic Exploratory Committee. Um, as mentioned, I'm with the law firm of Brownstein Hyatt, and I serve on the Exploratory Committee, as well as the Steering Committee, and I co-chair the Legal Subcommittee. So we're going to give you a quick 10-minute overview of kind of where the process has been and where we're going, um, saving five minutes at the end for questions, although, of course, if you have them in between, feel free to interrupt me. So we were tapped in December of last year um, with a couple key tasks. One was, should we host a games? Because I think there has been a presumption that we were formed to, in fact, conclude that we should host, where, in fact, that's not the case. We were asked to consider whether we should host. A second key component, and for me, one of the most critical components, was to determine whether or not the games could be privately financed. Thus far in the history of the Olympic Games, there has not been a privately financed Olympic Games. Next, what is the legacy? If we were to decide to bid on the games, if we were awarded the games, and we were to hold them in 2026 or 2030, what would be our legacy for our community? If you look back at the history of the Olympics, every community has kind of defined their, their legacy. For example, LA just haven't been awarded the bid. Their legacy is around youth sports programs. And so that'll be an interesting and, and fun question. If we get that far in the process, and we're privileged to have that debate to figure out what our legacy should be. So we were formed, as I mentioned, just in December of last year. 
because you know there was early criticism of the media that we weren't public enough. Well, that's an interesting question when you're not even sure what the concept of a privately financed games could be, how to even present it, the complications of developing a two and a half billion dollar budget for 13 years in the future. Um, so we need a little bit of time to organize before we could really start our community outreach. So again, formed in December, we were broken into five key committees. As you can see here from the chart, community and civic engagement, communications, games and operations, finance, and legal. And so from January 1 on, we have been meeting weekly as a subcommittee, we've been meeting monthly as an exploratory committee, and our steering committee meets weekly as well. Because we're on a fast track to figure out here pretty quickly whether or not our committee will recommend to the, to the Denver mayor and to the governor whether or not they should bid. So the way the process works is, of course, it starts from the top, and that's the International Olympic Committee. And they have expressed an interest, because so many of the recent games have been in Asia, they have expressed an interest in North America hosting a game again in the near future. And of course, importantly in our charge, it's not just the Olympics, it's the Paralympics, which we in, in Colorado with Winter Park are uniquely situated to be able to host. So the way that process works is IOC gives a clue to the, to the countries of the world whether or not they'd like to have your, your country considered. And then for us, of course, the USOC or our Olympic Committee then determines whether or not they want to, in fact, submit a bid. And then if they decide to submit a bid, the interested cities, and thus far for uh, 2026 and, and 2030, it's Reno, Salt Lake, and Denver, whether or not we should bid. Now the... Uh, it, Olympic Games have an interesting history, you know, great um, athleticism, great sports, uh, but also a little bit of baggage. And certainly one of the things that the IOC recognized is that their traditional bidding process was not working and that they needed to come up with a new bid process to encourage more cities like Denver to, to give it a, a consideration. Because we all know about the stories of, of Olympic Games held in far-flung empires who had to build all new facilities and the billions of dollars of debt that were incurred as a result. So they announced a new set of criteria called Agenda 2020. So for begin, bids beginning in 2026, um, here's the time frame, uh, which is uh, the dialogue phase, which is when IOC would consider a bid, would be September of this year. So it all backs out nine years. Um, Next, by March 31, 2018, the US, uh, USOC may select a U.S. city to bid. Now that time frame, if you may see in the media, um, seems to have sl slid a little bit, which is our preference, and I think the USC's preference, would be a 2030 bid. But there's always the possibility, um, if you look at how L.A. and Paris were awarded uh, the, recent, the upcoming games, it was in a dual bid. So there is a possibility we'd get a nod to say, would we consider bidding on 26? But clearly our preference is to bid on 2030. But we want to make sure we're ready if we get called upon uh, to be able to submit a bid for 26 and 30. So again, for the 2026 games, that would mean ultimately a host city selection by September 2019, which when you start the process in December 17 is not a very long process. So the history of the IOC is certainly challenged by corruption, doping, cost overrun, referendums. Boy, you couldn't come up with a better list than that. <laughs> and, uh, and that really drove uh, what they called Agenda 2020. So a focus on sustainability. Um, you know, back when we last were awarded the games and voted them down in 76, sustainability was not even in our, in our conversation. We talked about environment, but with the whole phrase is sustainability. Cost efficiency using existing or temporary infrastructure. Um, most people don't realize for the opening games in South Korea, that was a completely temporary uh, facility that housed 40,000 people. Some really nice stands and nice seats um, that will be taken down after the games because they've recognized that building these huge uh, structures that have no repurposing uh, makes no sense either for the host city or for the Olympics. There's a real focus on creating a legacy for each city and they've changed how they negotiate the dollars. So it used to be you had to front end all the dollars yourself and hope that you could recover it down the road. Uh, now, for example, for the 2030 Olympics, the IOC has announced that they would front 950 million uh, of that budget. And that money would start come to us from four years out. So for example, if we bid and if we were awarded the 2030 games, we would start to get cash flow from the IOC beginning in 2026 which dramatically changes the game because, of course, historically you had to raise all the money and hope that all these pieces of the pie came together. One of the things I found in talking to community groups and, and, and uh, certainly governmental units like yourself is 
I've never seen a public event that probably has less knowledge about what it really is. Um, so first of all, for context, the Winter Games are a much more manageable event than the Summer Games. You can see the contrast here. 207 nations participate in the Summer Games, only 94 in the winter. 11,000 athletes versus 2,000. 28 sports versus 7 sports. And 33 venues versus 16. So relative budget comparison, for example, Summer Games are roughly estimated to cost $8 billion to produce, um, whereas Winter Games are in that $2 billion, $2 billion plus range. One of the questions, because um, once people, once friends and colleagues and family members know you're involved in this discussion, um, you'll get all kinds of consternation. So one of the questions I'll ask people is I'll say, well, were you around January this year? Were you somewhere around downtown Denver? Yeah, you know. Did you notice much traffic, anything different? No, not really. And then I'll point out to them that if you look at this comparison on the slide, National Western this last year drew over 700,000 people over 16 days. By contrast, the 2010 Vancouver Games drew 600,000 people over 17 games. And the other comparison is National Western is coming to a single site on the outskirts of Denver, whereas in the Winter Games, of course, your, your venues are spread throughout the state, uh, both in Denver, Front Range, and Mountain Communities. And so you're taking those 600,000 spectators and really spreading it completely around. The other question I'll ask people is, were you, were you happen to be downtown Denver on Friday of Labor Day? Did you notice it was a chaos or anything? And most people say, no, I didn't know. We had 200,000 ticketed spectators downtown uh, on Friday of Labor Day. We had the CU-CSU football game. We had Taste of Colorado right next door with 150,000 people. And we had a Rockies game. So 200,000 people, which is likely more than you'd ever have in a single day of the Olympics, all in downtown Denver, most of us didn't even notice. One of the things that gives Denver a unique advantage, um, particularly when we look back at our history in the 70s and we look back to other cities bidding, is the fact that we have so many existing venues. So we need three to four ski resorts. Obviously, we have plenty in that category. We actually have more ice arenas than any city that's ever bid on a Winter Olympics. Um, but we do lack a couple of outdoor venues. So you'll see on the bottom of the slide to the left, sliding. We don't have a, a bobsled run. Um, we don't have a, a appropriately sized ski jump. So while the jump uh, outside of Steamboat, Howlson Hill, is very large, it doesn't meet Olympic standards, so that wouldn't qualify. And lastly, we don't have an existing Nordic facility. Nordic facilities are a little unique because they have to be held at a certain uh, altitude limit. So we can't just hold it, for example, up in Summit County or in Vail. It has to be somewhere um, around the six, 7,000 feet parameter, so it really changes the game. Of course, there's a number of non-competition venue requirements. You've got to have an athlete's village. So we've talked about having three villages, uh, one in and around Denver, uh, one perhaps in uh, two in the mountain communities, perhaps one in Dillon, one in Avon. Um, and, the, and the goal, of course, with those would, would be then to repurpose them long term. Workforce housing in the mountains is obviously a critical issue. And you know better than anybody else the critical issues in the Denver region around affordable housing. Um, we need a main media center. Well, we happen to have a very large convention center that would house a media center uh, with very few modifications. We need open and closing ceremonies. Um, so, for example, Salt Lake, our lead competitor, has one facility of 40,000 feet. We obviously have both Coors Field and Mile High Stadium, so very unique. And then the Metals Plaza is something that you could even hold out in Civic Center, where you need 10,000 uh, seating for 10,000 a night in terms of temporary stands. So again, in summary, we really just need three new venues and solve the villages. Um, so sliding, jumping, and Nordic, and then the Olympic villages. The hotel question is also interesting. If you look back at the Democratic National Convention, um, it used dramatically more hotel rooms than the Olympics ever would in Denver. And so today, our existing hotels, um, we have over 50,000 hotels in the Denver metro area, hotel rooms. Um, so between Denver and Eagle and Summit County uh, and Breckenridge, we think we have more than adequate uh, hotels. Uh, security is an interesting issue. Um, the federal government is required to join you in the bid solely for the purposes of uh, guaranteeing their support on security issues, which is a federal cost, not a state or local cost. Uh, we've already had outreach with state and local uh, security officials and police, um, and they're very comfortable with the notion. Having hosted the DNC, having hosted so many world-class events, they're very comfortable, and they believe in, in consultation with the federal government that they could step up and provide the security. You need transportation, and of course we have a world-class airport. Um, they would like designated Olympic lanes. Um, you know, one of the things people always struggle is how would we get enough people up I-70? We've all been stuck in that traffic. 
Um, well, interesting, you know, Vancouver uh, did it with only a two-lane highway going to Whistler. And so, you know, we certainly, well, we would all love to see I-70 improved, and that may happen throughout this process. It's not something we can guarantee. Um, but we believe that even today we could adequately deal with the traffic because, again, only a fraction of the events are skiing, snowboarding, jumping, and all that kind of stuff. And, of course, you've got to figure out a way to get the ticketed spectators around. But certainly with your leadership and looking at fast tracks, our ability to ha handle major events and get people around the city uh, certainly is superior to many of our competitors. Financing, really to me one of the most interesting questions as I mentioned early on. So a privately funded model. So what that means is um, we would form either a special purpose authority or a 501c3 that would serve what we call our OCOG or Olympic Committee, or Organizing Committee of the Olympic Games. Um, like everything else, it's all about the, getting the acronym straight. And so we would have our leading proposal at the moment would be to form a 501c3 because a special purpose authority, as many of you know better than I do, is either a creature of a specific city or a creature of the state. Well, we really see this as a statewide effort, uh, but with the 501c3, we'd have more flexibility in forming a board that would reflect a broad array of voices. We'd have more flexibility in financing. Um, and one of the questions I often get is, well, but if we form a 501c3 and the games make money, like Salt Lake, for example, made $80 million in 2002, then are those private corporations going to take the money? The answer is no. Uh, we would designate any surplus for the games for whatever community purposes our collective communities decided was important. Is that affordable housing? Is that, you know, you, oh, excuse me, the range of options we could come up with as to what to do with that surplus, but the surplus would not go back to the private donors. So we have a very complicated structure that we're going to um, evaluate, which involves having this 501c sign what's called the host city contract. That's your, a contract with the International Olympic Committee, which would be supported by layers of insurance. There are types of insurance I've never even heard of out there. Uh, then supported by corporate financial guarantees. And so that if you went through your deductibles and you went through your uh, insurance, you'd have the guarantees ultimately to backstop it. But most importantly, neither the city of Denver nor any other city nor the state of Colorado would be asked to sign on that guarantee. This just gives you a little bit of a legacy. Um, I said 80 million for Salt Lake. In fact, it was 90 million. Vancouver was 8 million. Uh, the summer games back in L.A. of recent uh, was $200 million. So no Olympic Games hosted in North America has lost money. So our view on that is if you can do it in a way where we never risk taxpayer dollars on a, on a state or city level and have this track record in North America of knowing how to do it, uh, that we ought to build a financial model that, that projects a surplus at the end of the games, again, if we get that far along in this process. So we have really started an aggressive community outreach. Um, there's been there are online surveys. Um, we have a, a group called Share the Gold, which is comprised of 65 community members from every special interest you can think of within the metro region. Uh, we're doing similar uh, programs up in Summit County and Vail because um, we really do want to hear. Now that we understand enough of a framework where we can begin to explain what kind of in our minds, we now want to get the, the feedback from the community. So the types of concerns we've heard are, Number one, the cost to put on the games. And as I mentioned, we're, we're uniquely situated to have only a handful of new facilities we need to build. Congestion in Denver in the I-70 Mountain Corridor, it's a legitimate issue. And no one can sit here and, and, you know, we look at Salt Lake experience, and obviously the federal government put in over $2 billion in the federal highway surrounding Salt Lake. We have no control over that. We would obviously seek improvements to I-70, but we can't assure what that would look like 13 years from now and whether or not our delegation could work with us to secure those funds. Population growth, it's one of those interesting misunderstood facts. You may not recall, but Lake Placid has hosted two Olympics, and it's still a pretty sleepy upstate New York community. There's no stats that show that holding the Olympics in increases population. It does have a de demonstrated effect on uh, bringing in international tourists. Salt Lake now has a much bigger share of international tourism than they did for hosting the games, but no overall population growth. Some citizens fairly argue that, you know, this is a distra distraction. We ha you, every day in your jobs, you are facing all these critical issues of education that we can't figure out how to pay for, affordable housing, and shouldn't we take all these great resources and all this great energy and devote it to those causes? I think that's a legitimate question, and, and what we're hoping through this process is if we can define a way, for example, to create a sustainable impact on affordable housing, maybe this will be a different way to help solve the problems that you deal with. Uh, environmental concerns, those are a big issue in the 70s. I think it's less of a concern today, but one we'd have to be focused on. Um, the IOC, as a requirement of bidding, 
has a zero impact policy, and so we would have to have a, a net zero policy. And um, can we achieve that? You know, it's too early to tell. I mean, we're only 10 weeks into this, uh, but if you look at where our ski areas have already advanced in terms of their uh, sustainability po policies, and then project 13 years in the future, you would think that we'd be able to take the base that we have today and grow upon that. Uh, only for the elite. Um, it is, you know, it is a, a sport, a relatively few sports, and it's not, many of them are not s sports that every citizen participates in. Um, but, you know, we've certainly talked about ways to make sure that a wide array of our community members have an opportunity to participate through discounted tickets, through a whole variety of programs, um, through minority contracting and small business contracting. How do we make sure that this is a benefit for the entire community of our state and not just the perceived elite? And then lastly, at least on this slide, is the reputation for Olympic cities failing. Completely legitimate when you look at all the far-flung Olympics, but not so legitimate when you look at the experience in North America. So why should we do this? Um, well, I think, first of all, uh, for those of us who have now dove into this last 10 weeks, seeing this new Agenda 2020 and then a subsequent policy that was announced at the South, Re South Korea Games called the New Norm, which is really trying to create this much more livable, bidding environment where cities and states don't have to risk bankruptcy over it, I think it now makes sense to take a look at it. Uh, the budgets are certainly more manageable and certainly could be in Colorado based on our existing uh, finances. Uh, again, the key question to me, and I, you know, as one who's chairing the legal committee, um, we will not make a recommendation to go forward unless we feel like we really do have a valid legal structure to create privately financed games. Because to me, if that answer is no, this is a non-starter. Um, we've got to be able to prove that model. Um, lastly, can we make this kind of impact? Can we improve affordable housing in our metro area? And can we address I-70 congestion? No more complica complicated question than I-70 congestion. It's obviously already a, a record of decision on what to do. That's a really complicated one. But obviously, we would use this as a momentum, uh, as a springboard with our congressional delegation to find ways, the way Salt Lake did, to bring in federal dollars to help with it. So, What could the Winter Olympics provide? We can certainly obviously a showcase, not just for Denver, but for the entire metro area and for the state. Um, an opportunity to look at planning and smart growth. You know, when you're looking at large scale villages, the way we're talking about, it's an opportunity to look in the future 13 years and decide what makes sense. You know, economic stimulus, we're in a funny point in the cycle. Um, whoever thought we'd have such a relatively unhappy citizenry with low un unemployment, wage growth finally starting a little bit, and everybody's tired of, of the population growth and the effect on traffic and everything else. But 13 years from now, who knows where we'll be in the economic cycle? And so that's why I think this, this issue deserves such a, such a hard look. An inspiration for future generations. I don't know about you, I, I grew up watching the Olympics with my parents and my brothers, and I watch it now with my daughters. And like when that 17-year-old kid from Silverthorne won the gold medal early on, I had tears in my eyes. I was so pumped up. So there is that legacy of the Olympics that would be so fun to attach to. But again, we have to answer so many questions before we could ever get to that point. And lastly, Olympic values. Where else other than the Olympics would you see North Korea and South Korea form a team together, march together, uh, really unique? No other environment, perhaps in the world, that you would see that happen. So. so hopefully I kept within my 10 minutes, maybe a little bit too long, but uh, now open to questions if you have time. Questions or comments? Director Flynn. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Bruce. Uh, just a couple questions on the $950 million from the IOC. Is that a 2026 figure? Is the 2030 figured higher, or is it 950 fixed for any future game for the time being? It's a great question. That is for the 2026, okay. and we would expect it to be appropriately increased for 2030. Okay, and then, and then the second part of that is where does the IOC get its money from to give us that money? Um, from their own set of sponsorship revenues. Um, mm -hmm. So the major contracts, like the Comcast TV contract, is an IOC contract. So there's a whole series of contracts that are, that are, are based solely within the IOC, there would be a number of local sponsorship contracts that our OCOG, or Organizing Committee, would control. We would capture that. But the really, really big ones are, are controlled by the IOC. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Other questions? Director Teeter. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out there is a third stadium in the area. It's in Commerce City called Dick's Sporting Goods. <laughs> <laughs> What Every venue is under consideration. <laughs> no decisions have been made. And certainly a focus on making sure we, we engage the entire front range. What, uh, what municipality do you represent, Mr. Teeter? <laughs> Other questions or comments? Okay. 
Seeing none, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, and I'm sure we have a lot more information to come in the coming months. Thanks Great. very much. Thanks. So before we uh, move on, uh, we did have the uh, alternate for Denver join us, so I wanted to introduce uh, Jolyn Clark. Jolyn, if you just stand and wave real quick. All right. So next we have report of the chair. Um, should be fairly pain, painless. On the RTC, RTC was canceled, so there's no report. The announcement of public hearing, I have a, uh, a script here to read, so I will tell you that the Denver Regional Council of Governments, Dr. Cog, has scheduled a public hearing for March 21st at 6.30 p.m. in this conference room to receive comments on proposed amendments to the MetroVision plan and to the 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan and any associated air quality conformity determinations. Further information about the public hearing is available on Dr. Cog's website, including the proposed amendments and how to provide comment. The next item in my report is performance and engagement. Director Pfeiffer. Uh, this month's uh, meeting was canceled. Very good. Finance and Budget, Director Dyack. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, we had a couple items uh, tonight. Uh, we gave uh, the Executive Director the right to negotiate, execute a right to lease listing to sublease this space, hopefully. Uh, we have about three years remaining on this current space. Uh, hopefully we can get that subleased and uh, get some money back in our coffers. And we also gave uh, the Executive Director authorization to negotiate, execute on-call contracts for operational uh, situations here at Dr. Cog. So that's it. Any questions or comments about the report? Alrighty. And next I'd like to call Director Dyack up here for his five-year service award. If, if you serve on this board for five years, you've really done something. <laughs> get a gold medal. <laughs> there's there's color it's gold leafing? No, no, it's just colored gold. <laughs> so we gotta do this thing? Yeah you do. Alright. Hold up, hold up. You can buy drinks after too. Can I? <laughs> it's against the rules now. <laughs> Sure that goes on the Parker website. That's the one, yeah. That's the one going in my newsletter, I can tell you that. Wow. I'm a little flushed now. Yeah. All right, the next agenda item is agenda item seven, report of the executive director, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a number of items here, but I'll be quick. I want to to give my time to uh, Sam Light here to give his presentation. Um, so first of all, I know I keep saying this and I will until our event, the annual award celebration is on April 25th at the Hyatt just down the street here, 15th in California, and um, this really is your event, right? This is hosted by the Dr. Cog um, Board of Directors, so, um, so, we, you know, so we obviously would like you to attend. Um, you're invited to attend free of charge. Um, there's a code on the flyer um, that you'll want to use. Uh, you can also bring a guest at a discounted rate of $49, uh, so we sincerely hope you'll join us in recognizing uh, the regional excellence. Uh, Winter Bike to Work Day was held a couple weeks ago, um, Friday, February 9th, um, and our Way to Go team have been working with CDOT and as well as 25 other uh, stakeholders throughout the, throughout the state. Um, and uh, we set a goal of 1,000 riders for that day statewide, and we, 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 we crushed it. We uh, got about 3,000 wow. registrants. Um, on Bike to Work Day, uh, 2,500 of those were within this region. And there was, you know, part of this whole deal was an international challenge, and Denver finished second and Boulder finished third in the world nice. as far as sign-ups. How about that? Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Aurora also uh, finished 15th place, and we had a number of other communities in the top 50, including Littleton, Lakewood, and Englewood. So that's all pretty cool. So in aggregate, we were by far number one. Right, Steve? Atta boy. <laughs> so, um, board short courses, we have a little flyer on that. We have three scheduled, or three main um, 
areas uh, have been scheduled. Um, so if you're interested in a deeper dive into any, either one of those programs, please sign up to see Connie, and uh, she'll get you all signed up. Um, Metrovision Idea Exchange, that's also at your seat. We're hosting our first Metrovision Exchange for 2018, um, and it's in this room on February, February 28th from 10 till noon. Um, as you all know, and as, uh, as the speaker just, just mentioned, uh, affordability and housing has been a big, pretty big issue the past few years here. Um, and as a result, many communities are seeing a dramatic increase in mul multiple families occupying a single residency, so, um, which is also known, they refer to it as doubling up. So, but however, such arrangements um, often run afoul of uh, building occupancy codes and zoning ordinance and restrictions. So we, on, on the 28th, we have some industry experts that are going to be here and public officials to share their, expen their experiences. Um, with policy and enforcement responses to this trend of doubling up. We, re we are receiving tremendous response to this, to this uh, ideas, idea exchange. So if you're interested, please sign up here in the next day or so. We, we, uh, we're reaching, quickly reaching capacity on that. Um, I know many of you are familiar with, uh, with Transit Alliance. I know many of you mm -hmm. are familiar with them. Um, you may also know that Transit Alliance, they decided after 19 years to, uh, that it was time to say farewell. They closed the doors. And, and um, one of the assets that Transit Alliance had, and they were very interested in, uh, in someone uh, continuing on, was their Citizens Academy. And I know there was at least one of you all, I know Bob Pfeiffer went through it, uh, maybe some other here went through the Citizens Academy, that, um, that they've done for... I, 12 plus years, I know they've been doing it. Director Mullica raised her hand as well. Director Mullica? Yeah. Has too? No, I was just saying I, I did it as well and I thought it was very fun. Yeah, very good. So, um, so actually, um, the executive, rec executive director Kathleen Osher and um, their board chair, Chris Waggett, they reached out to us about our interest in, in uh, uh, continuing that tradition of CIS Academy, and we were, we were thrilled with the, with the opportunity. First and foremost, selfishly, it provides an additional venue for us with regards to for our public involvement. Uh, you know, we have, we're, we're trying to put a stronger emphasis on our public involvement. We're in the process now of creating a new public involvement plan, so this kind of fit right into that. Um, so we're, we, are, we will be taking over the Citizens Academy. They hold two academies a year. And um, so we're really excited about it. So I wanted to share that with you. We also hope it's an added value for our member governments as well. Um, we will be reaching out to you all um, with, with the potential and the opportunity to sponsor citizens that you would like to be more engaged in, in the planning process and understanding more about what it is you all do and what we do in this region and you know, so they, they have a better understanding. So we will be reaching out. Um, the next one is scheduled for late spring. We're still trying to determine if we can, we can get everything, all our ducks in a row to get there. But I wanted to share that information with you. Um, visit. So over the last month or so, I've had an opportunity to address several city councils and other associated groups. Um, primarily, it's, you know, it was an opportunity to introduce myself as the, as the new executive director, um, but also, of course, to share some of the programs and services that Dr. Cog provides. I've done Federal Heights, uh, Brighton last week, I think it was, um, Adams County Board of County Commissioners, uh, ADCOG a couple times. Uh, Littleton, we, uh, we had a meeting with uh, Public Works and Planning staff, which I thought was very useful, and Director Elrod and her alternate to the board attended that. Um, so long story short to tell you, listen, I'd like to do more of these if possible. I think it's a great opportunity for me to introduce myself to the entire councils, but also uh, you know, make sure everybody, because you know, councils turn over too, that everybody understands what we do and the service we provide, because we truly believe that we are an extension of your staff. So we want to provide an added value to you all, and we want to become more service-oriented to, to help you in uh, fulfilling the, uh, the issues and challenges that you all have as well. Um, last but not least, I would like to uh, give a special shout out to uh, Director Steve Conklin. Um, Steve has done a couple of brown bag, we do a couple of brown bag lunch. We do a brown bag lunch in here with, for staff once a month, on the third Thursday, I think, of the month. And Steve actually has done two for us. He's done one associated with the history of radio in this, in this area. And the one that was last week, he did on the, what we, what we deemed anyway, the golden age of TV. And uh, it, it, both are tremendous. So if you, hey, I know his first love is really radio. 
So if you ever have a need for a speaker for a luncheon or something, it's fabulous. Especially those that have, you know, grew up here in that. It's really, it's a walk down memory lane. And for newbies like me, it provided some perspective about, you know, how, just how it all works, right, and how, how it all came to be. So thank you, Steve, for doing that. And I, I would strongly encourage. So then, that's it for me. Um, what I would like to do now is, um, is turn this over to our legal counsel, Sam Light. Uh, we, um, uh, you know, I mentioned, you know, counsels turn over uh, a lot. Our, our, our uh, board turns over quite a bit as well. It turns over about 25% uh, about every two years. So that's pretty, sub it's pretty substantial. And, and as we get in more into this whole sub-regional process, the new TIP process and all, we'll be creating a bunch of new committees and all that. So I want, want to invite Sam back just to give you a quick briefing on the open meetings uh, law. Um, he did this a couple years ago, and you know I know half of you guys weren't even here then, so we thought it was a good opportunity given what we're getting into at the tip. So without further ado, I'll turn it to Mr. Light. Thank you, all sir. Right. Thank you very much. It's good to see you all again. Um, I'm Sam Light from the law firm of Light Kelly. I serve as your general counsel. I think Doug mentioned you can sign up for some short courses. I assure you this will be the shortest of the short courses. <laughs> it's kind of a bonus short course uh, for free. Um, and what I'd like to do is just spend a couple of minutes talking about the Colorado Open Meetings Law that applies to Dr. Cog and its board of directors and committees. Um, and summarize the rules for you, reserve a couple of minutes for uh, questions uh, at the end, and just hit the highlights. H having said that, you know, we are an uh, institution that's made up of cities and towns and counties. So this presentation is uh, myself as your counsel, Dr. Cog's counsel, giving you uh, an overview of this law as it applies to the Dr. Cog entity and the Dr. Cog board and committees. Uh, how many of you have gotten a similar presentation from your own city or county or town council, right? Okay, so um, if uh, something I say is contrary to what they say, then you can blame that all on one of us. Yeah. Pick, pick, pick one uh, <laughs> if your own local city, town, or uh, county attorney gives you uh, differing thoughts. But I'm going to keep it at a very high level and just hit the main uh, rules. We're going to talk um, in essence, what are the two main rules? And there are two. There's a notice rule and an openness rule. We're going to talk about who's covered. Well, that's, that, that's you all. Um, what is a meeting is some, something of a fascinating topic. It's uh, a little bit more uh, intense than just saying, I know a meeting when I see one, right? Uh, so we'll talk about what the actual legal rule is there. And then briefly, what are the exemptions that apply? Uh, before I dig into that, I think it's a, a fascinating um, overarching theme of the open meetings law just to recite what the state policy is right at the beginning of the state statute and I have it on your screen here and it says it's declared to be a matter of statewide concern and the policy of the state of Colorado that the formation of public policy is public business and may not be conducted in secret to me the linchpin of that um, policy statement is the word formation it's not the announcement of the policy or the, the meeting at which you make the final decision or the rubber stamping uh, of some policy um, position arrived at by some other means, it's a window into how public policy is formed. And that's the intent of the state statute, is to give um, your constituent citizens a window into how you reach the policies that you adopt. It does not mean that citizens or your constituents have a right at every meeting to be heard necessarily. That's what you have public hearings for, and I know one was announced earlier. Um, but it does evince this intent that it's a window into the process. Process is so important as what we do uh, at this level of governance, right? Okay, let's go into a little bit more into the nitty-gritty here. What are the two key rules of the open meetings law, right? Um, the first one is the openness rule, which says that all meetings of a quorum or three or more members of a local public body whichever is less at which any public business is discussed or at which any formal action may be taken are public meetings open to the public. So we have 50 some odd uh, members on the board of directors here, of course, so the rule applies to which number here? It applies to three. When three or more members of the Dr. Cog board are together discussing public business, then that's an open meeting. Okay, the second half of that then is the notice rule, which says that any meeting at which the adoption of any proposed 
policy, position, resolution, rule, regulation, or formal action occurs, or at which a majority of you all, or a quorum of you all is in attendance, or even expected to be in attendance, uh, is a meeting in which we have to provide full and timely notice, which under your local articles is 48 hours notice. Under the state law, it's 24 hours, but you affirmatively chose when you were organized to adopt a 48 hour of rule. So the two parts of that, again, are when three or more are together uh, talking about public business of the Dr. Cog board, then that's an open meeting if someone can observe the discussion. Uh, but if it's one where we anticipate that a um, majority may be there or a quorum may be there or where we anticipate say, taking some action, and then we have the additional step of providing notice and agenda. These are all uh, fairly self-executing rules, right? We all got here tonight knowing that the staff had sent out notice and agenda for tonight's meeting. Uh, but it's the things on the margins that uh, require attention, such as when we get together in smaller groups, how do the rules apply, right? Okay. Uh, who's covered? Well, that's pretty self-evident, but just so you know what the legal rule is, the open meetings rule, open meetings law applies to every local public uh, body um, that has a meeting for the discussion of public purpose. A local public body includes any board, committee, commission, or other policy-making, rule-making, or advisory, or formally constituted body of a political subdivision of the state. Well, that, that includes Dr. Cog. You're an association of local governments. You exercise a number of governmental decision-making functions on behalf of your members, uh, so the rules apply. There's a sim similar definition for uh, a state public body. Getting a little bit closer to home, well, who are we really talking about in terms of who does the open meetings rule apply to? Um, this board, the executive committee, the finance and budget committee, performance and engagement, the nominating committee, uh, and other committees that you have that are formally created by the board to carry out <clears throat> governmental decision-making functions on behalf of the Dr. Cog board. We have in our committee guidelines an express statement that our committees will follow uh, the open meetings law. Now we get to the sort of interesting question here. What, what is a meeting, right? What is a meeting? As I mentioned, um, the open meetings law requires openness for meetings of public bodies, well, a meeting is, is a gathering, right, which you can have by telephone or electronic means, that means email, or you can have it in person, um, and it's a meeting when it's a gathering of three or more members, for our purposes, three or more members of the board, for county commissioners where you have three commissioners, two of you, triggers the open meetings law, but I'll leave that to the county attorneys. Um, so you gotta have three or more members and it's a gathering at which public business is discussed. So therein lies the rub, right? What is, what is public business? Anyone have thoughts on that? What's public business? Anything in your policy-making wheelhouse is the way I describe it. You know, we can spend a fair amount of time getting into the weeds about the cases that interpret this phrase, but if it's a gathering of three or more members of the board or three or more members of one of your committees at which you're discussing public business that is policy making matters that are within your authority, then that's a meeting where the openness rule applies. And again, if it's a meeting where you're gonna take action or adopt a rule or take some formal action, then that's one where you have to additionally provide the notice. Uh, our Supreme Court has stated a meeting must be part of the policy-making process to be subject to the requirements of the open meetings law. A meeting, let's get a little circular here, but this is what our Supreme Court says, a meeting is part of the public policy-making process if it concerns matters related to the policy-making functions. Hmm, a lot of policy phrases in there, but um, if it relates to the policy issues that are in your wheelhouse and you have a meeting of three or more people that talk about a pending policy matter, then that's something that's subject to the openness rules, okay? Um, anyone have any questions or thoughts on that idea? Questions or comments? <coughs> Director Beacom. Just a simple con question. Because this deals with Dr. Cog, mm -hmm. if three or more of its directors are together and chatting about 
issues that maybe impact their municipality but not directly dr cog is that still a public meeting um well, I'll, car I'll carve out, stake out a couple of easy examples. If the member of the three is to get together to talk about how we're going to vote on something on tonight's Dr. Cog agenda, well, that's a something that's a policy making issue within Dr. Cog's <coughs> wheelhouse, and you've got three directors getting together to talk about something in the Dr. Cog's board wheel wheelhouse, right? Um, you know, to stake out another example, if it's three or more. Um, members of the Dr. Cog board and Dr. Cog does not have any pol pending matter on the issue and doesn't reasonably foresee that it's become going to become a pending policy matter um, then it's unrelated to Dr. Cog's policy making functions and our rules would not be implicated now it may be that those three people if they get together if it's two county commissioners and one city council member from a county where, where you've got three commissioners well that might trigger the, the openness requirements for that that county to give notice uh, and an agenda. I'll give you an example from one of our cases of uh, uh, show you how these rules might, might apply. Um, there was a situation where uh, two, and this is a, um, a reported appellate decision out of our out of, out of our courts. There was a meeting where uh, two county commissioners went to a meeting that was held by the. State Department of Public Health and Environment and the Department of Natural Resources and a mine operator. So those three entities called the meeting to talk about the compliance of the mine operator with a consent order that was issued by the state. But they called the county commissioners and said, do you want to come to this meeting? I said, sure. Maybe the trouble started when it was found out that the meeting was held at a restaurant called The Hideaway. And, uh, you know, maybe that, Maybe that didn't help, but but you know you know how these things happen. Someone sees the two county commissioners at this meeting at this restaurant, and they question, well, what's going on? Is is that a county commissioners meeting? What what's going on here? Well, it turns out that the discussion was about the compliance with the state consent order. The county commissioners didn't have anything pending on their agenda related to the consent order. In fact, they didn't have any authority over that issue, right? And they just passively listened to what was essentially a technical presentation on the issue. Um, and given those facts, the court said, no, the county didn't have an obligation to provide notice. And so it was okay if two of them attended that meeting. But let's, you know, uh, change those facts slightly. Let's say that the meeting was actually to talk about whether or not the mine could get a uh, new zoning permit which is something that the county would have to act on. And the county commissioners participated in the discussion. Now we have two county commissioners talking about something that is, quote, in their wheelhouse, right? And if those were the facts, I think the county would have to give notice that two of the commissioners were attending that meeting. So I, I encourage you to sort of look at the situation that you suggest with the same uh, lens, is are we really having a discussion of some policy matter that is or is going to be in Dr. Cog's wheelhouse. Um, you know, in your upcoming sub-regional forum issue, we talked about the concept that that is really going to be under the structure of Dr. Cog's governance and that they then, therefore, as an extension of Dr. Cog, do need to provide notice and conduct their business as open meetings because that is part of a policy uh, undertaking that is within the board's wheelhouse. Okay. Director Atchison. Going back to Sam's comments, something I would ask you to think about, Council, the agenda item 11 for tonight. When you start those regional, sub-regional meetings, you will have more, in particular, more than three members. Those meetings all will have to be posted, with the exception of Broomfield. In Denver. Because Broomfield only has one member on the board and they are a city and county within themselves. Denver may have an issue because they have at least two voting members on the board, but if they have one of their alternates in there, they could be squeaky on it. So, Kevin, you and your partners will have to figure that one out. But for most of us, when you start meetings with the county and the municipalities within that county, you're going to exceed the three-member rule. So all those meetings will have to be posted. 
Uh, Executive Director Rex has a comment. Well, I was just going to say that we anticipate that all those meetings will be posted. All the sub-regional forum meetings will be posted regardless. Uh, Director Vidal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, asking you, uh, Mr. Light, a hypothetical question. An item comes before uh, the Dr. Cog uh, board, a, a discussion occurs, a vote is taken, the matter is over, uh, the directors are leaving the room. So on the way out, uh, three directors uh, sort of, re I'll say, review uh, the events of the evening. Since a vote has already been taken, is, is it improper for those directors to discuss the matter? In, in your world, um, quite often the actions you take, the light doesn't go on and off so neatly. Governmental work is a living, breathing thing and goes on and decisions are revisited or decisions come back to you or some ancillary issue comes up. I mean, the way you framed it, if it was that neat, one could argue that there is no longer a pending policy matter within our wheelhouse. Uh, but frankly, uh, quite often the discussion itself is not that neat either, so I would be cautious, right? Uh, but the hypothetical you framed, um, you know, it's so close in time, the decision was done. Um, the question is, uh, what discussion are we having, right? If we're having, is it still related to some policy issue that may come forward in the, in the, in the future? If so, I would be cautious about that, right? But I do appreciate the point that you're just doing a debrief that's something that's off the plate forever then sure, one can argue that there was not an open meetings issue, so. Director Zabel. Thank you. Um, with his hypothetical, wasn't that meeting already posted? It was. It was. Okay, so what do you have yeah. to post every little meeting when you well, talk uh, to somebody? I mean, that gets out of hand. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah but if, uh, I assume in your hypothetical, I guess, I don't know if you mentioned it, that the meeting was adjourned. And so we've sent the signal to the world that we're done with the meeting, right? But I, I, I still go back to after the meeting's adjourned, we sent the signal that the meeting's over. It would be akin to uh, adjourning a city council meeting and then uh, we turn off the TV, everyone leaves, and we still remain at the dais and talk. That, that's not an open meeting, I suppose. I, I, you're, you're saying that someone could say, sure it is, it's still open, right? Um, I, I'm not sure that's the best practice, right, to send the signal that the meeting's over, everyone go home but only if you're in the know that we might hang around and still talk, <laughs> do you have a window into a, that portion of the policymaking discussion. So. Other questions or comments? Uh, one last slide on, uh, oops, I think I went the wrong way, excuse me. On um, some exceptions and where the rules don't apply. So the open meetings law expressly do not apply to any chance meeting or a social gathering at which discussion of public business is not the central purpose. So uh, simply a dinner or uh, three or more of you or a social gathering of some type is fine. It doesn't have to be noticed or open. It also doesn't apply to the administrative staff. So if two members of the board seek to meet with your executive director and some other staff, that is not a meeting that has to be open or posted because you've only got two members of the Dr. Cog board and you do not count the administrative staff as individuals that trigger the rules, um, or to meetings of fewer than three uh, for your purposes since you have such a large board. Uh, so one-on-one -on -one meetings are uh, permissible, right? That quite often leads to the question of, well, can we have one-on-one -on -one meetings and then another one-on-one -on -one meeting and then another one-on-one -on -one meeting? And the question is, uh, well, part of the response is for a, a board of 56 or 57 members, that, that's a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, but more uh, legally, um, we don't have that reported appellate decision yet, but someday we're going to get it. And it's going to answer the question of whether such a one-on-one -on -one type of serial meeting is something that is permitted or not permitted under the open meetings law. And I predict the answer is going to be no, it's not permitted because it's tantamount to conducting a meeting without meeting the openness or the notice requirements. Uh, so someone, well I should ask, has anyone faced that allegation locally? You don't have to answer that. Um, <laughs> but it'll, it'll bubble up to the appellate level at some point uh, and, I, and I think the answer will be that that's not uh, permitted. 
And then finally, reaching back to the hypotheticals that we talked through, if the meeting is one where you as Dr. Cog directors attend, but it's called by another entity, and it's not at that meeting a discussion of something that's in our policy-making wheelhouse, we don't have a pending policy matter before us as the Dr. Cog board, then that's not one that we're responsible for ensuring there's notice and openness requirements. But given the number of intergovernmental relations that we have as a Dr. Cog board and the fact that many of our partners will be calling and convening these meetings, we'll probably end up at the same place anyway where their staffs may be posting this as a public meeting and taking care of that administrative task. And then on the looking forward on the sub-regional piece, I know there are some discussions going on currently at the staff level about how that process will um, uh, carry itself out uh, to the extent of which the Dr. Cog staff will support uh, providing the notices and the agendas for those meetings. So, Director all of that, I thank you very much for your time. And I saw Director one other Brock, question, yeah. I think. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and so, to that point about the notice, <clears throat> so the sub regional forms are all going to be noticed, which is great. And Dr. Cog is going to notice them as Dr. Cog meetings. But will, will you also be reaching out to our staffs? Because it seems probably citizens who are interested in that would be citizens of our own communities. And that would probably be a good place to notice those as well. So is that something you're anticipating? It is. Um, in, in the agenda item that was, that was uh, acknowledged earlier, you know, we, at least the proposal of the TIP policy work group is that in noticing, um, we would request that we're, the host community would post according to how they host public meetings but also would follow Dr. Cog's procedure too. So Great. at a minimum, Dr. Cog will post in the binder down, down here as well as on our website. Right. I know many of my citizens come down here regularly to check that. So that's <laughs> not sure. No, no, no. So it's good we do it locally too. Thank you. <laughs> I've got Director Chrisman and the Director Partridge. Director Chrisman. Um, what legal entity is charged with enforcing this and what are the penalties associated with violating it? Uh, so the state statute uh, allows um, any individual who believes there's been a violation to uh, commence a legal action. The remedies are the courts can issue an injunction, um, essentially an order that says don't do it again. If the violation actually uh, relates to a meeting at which some formal action were taken, then the courts have the power to overturn the action taken. Um, and you have to then, well, where does that leave you practically, right? it means you have to do a, a do-over, right, which uh, gets you there legally. You will have a legal path to cure uh, the violation. Um, setting aside the legal aspect of it, there's the question of um, repairing the trust issue that was uh, potentially impaired by having a violation and having to go through a process to correct a violation. Uh, there are some interesting cases that speak to that, yeah. but from a legal standpoint, if you violated the law by not giving notice of your hearing, let's say that you had come up next month and the agenda was not posted or what have you, and someone said, aha, that, that's a violation, the outcome of the hearing could be set aside. The end result is you have another hearing with proper notice. Uh, and then finally, um, a successful plaintiff in an open meetings law challenge is, uh, can get an award of their attorney's fees, which are uh, charged against the entity if the entity is found to be in violation. But there's not a state agency that polices local compliance with open meetings. It's a judicial process. No. Director Partridge. Thank you, Sam. It was great. So when it comes to taking minutes on a meeting, can you comment on taking minutes? Because that may be a whole other topic, I realize. But can you just at least address that superficially? Uh, the state statute requires that uh, any meeting at which action is taken, there shall be minutes. Um, the state law doesn't say one way or the other whether they're uh, what some people might call action minutes that just record the actions taken. Uh, the far other end of the spectrum is verbatim minutes. And, uh, you know, I don't think I know of anyone who does it verbatim unless we're in, and that's not minutes, that's a transcript. So um, entities decide somewhere in between where they want to land. Um, and so it's up to the entity uh, to do that, but there is a requirement under state law to maintain minutes for any meetings at which actions are taken. So, yeah. so I have a situation where two commissioners come together. Are you gonna cover this meeting or am I? A decision's been made, how do we handle that? Oh, in terms of who takes the minutes? Right, I actually have my uh, uh, 
Yes, my uh, secondary, my. Your peer? No, my total alternate here. Yes, alternate. thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> my alternate here. <laughs> uh, I may be getting into a question of county law or county staffing or who's going to be the volunteer. Uh, but I might have to punt that to the county attorney who may ask to come back to you and, and to say you might need an FTE. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, if, quite frankly, in, in some situations where you have that and there's not staff available, it really is a question of getting together with staff and figuring out who's going to prepare some summary of the meeting, right? So, We had a situation if we were together earlier today and we get, hey, I actually have something coming up. Are you able to make the meeting tonight? And the alternate says yes or the primary says no or whatever, but there's some decision made, just happenstance. We don't have to have staff there, but where do you draw the line on the situation? Yeah, yeah, I'd so, certainly well, defer to the county attorney's office on those kind of questions, but if your example was the discussion was just about something that was not policy making at all, right, the, then we go back to that initial question, if it was just two, um, let's say it was three of you, I'll expand it to all of you, let's say it's just three of you got together and decided, uh, well, who here is going to make the meeting tonight? That's not really a policy making question, right, so this is the answer of having a brief discussion among three or board members. Uh, of the Dr. Cog board saying, are you going to the meeting? No, I'm not. Or can you go and uh, let me know what happened? Sure, I'll do that. That's, that's not going to be a policy-making decision in and of itself. So that brief informal discussion isn't even going to trigger the open meetings law in my mind. But going back to uh, Director Bidham's uh, question, if it is um, the meeting of three individuals who want to talk about something that is pending in front of Dr. Cog, then it would trigger the open meetings law. And there are certainly ways the board as a board could set aside some time to talk further about whether and how and if at all they wanted to enable that sort of smaller group discussion while making sure that Dr. Cog as an entity complies with the open meetings law. But that's, that's probably for another day. So. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. So there was one item on the report of the chair that I meant to cover real quick and I forgot. Um, we had a delegation here from Ukraine uh, earlier this week, last week, last week, and uh, Director Dyack and I were able to be here and uh, entertain them. And it was kind of interesting. When they first walked into the room, I thought, I didn't know this was a student delegation. I thought this was, it wasn't a student delegation. They were elected officials. It was council members and mayors from various regions throughout Ukraine. There was uh, probably about 10 of them. There was at least one mayor and the rest were council members in various areas. And probably the oldest one was early 30s and the youngest one was early 20s. And they were very interested, asked a lot of really good questions about um, our structure and ironic with having John and I there since he is a smaller town and, and Aurora is a little bit larger city. We had a little different perspectives on things, but they really got a good flavor of the region, what Dr. Cog does. Uh, Rich Morrow sat in and gave a lot of uh, good legislative uh, information from the state level. So we talked about uh, towns and cities and the state legislature, and they got a really good overall. We were supposed to go for an hour and a half, and we went for at least two. And it was really a very good meeting. They were um, just drinking it up and wanted follow-up information from our individual websites and from Dr. Cog website. So it was really a very interesting meeting to, to have elected officials from an Eastern European country here. And um, the, the things that they're talking about and the uh, progress that they're making, given where they were, is is pretty incredible so i just thought i wanted to share that it was very interesting john i don't know if you want to add anything uh i i am from i guess my descents are from ukraine so they they told me what my last name was and i don't know if you remember it was it was something to do with um second in command for a holy man or something well, like that holy one yeah sort of what, what <laughs> they came so and that and that was that was the end of the meeting thank you, thank you. <laughs> he, yeah, he teed that one up, didn't he? <laughs> All right, the next item on the agenda is agenda item eight, which is public comment. 
Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment. Each speaker will be given three minutes. If there are additional requests beyond the 45 minutes, the public uh, will be able to have time allocated at the end of the meeting to complete any public comment. We do request that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. And our consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Do we have anyone here this evening that would like to address the board? See nobody, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Under attachment B, basically the consent agenda is just the meetings from the last meeting, excuse me, the minutes from the last meeting. There is one change that I have to note, and that is that Richard Champion, director from Columbine Valley, was in attendance, so we need to add him to the list of members attending. Any other changes or modifications? If not, I'd entertain a motion. Second. Have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. Action agenda. Agenda item 10, election of officers under attachment C. Turn it over to Director Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It was my honor to be chosen as the chair of the nominating committee, so I'm going to make our report. But let me start by thanking the members of the nominating committee for their extra service to Dr. Cog, and those members include Director Ron Rakowski, Director Steve Conklin, Director Rita Dozell, uh, Director Roger Partridge, and Director Robin Kanich. So thank you all for putting some extra time and, and doing the important role of helping choose the leadership of Dr. Cog. Um, for new folks, um, the nominating committee is tasked with recommending a slate of board officers to the board for your consideration at this meeting every year. Um, board members are also free to make nominations from the floor. Um, in order to make sure that the chair is properly trained and prepared to take over the helm, um, it has been the tradition of Dr. Cog to add one new board officer each year and have everybody else move up the ladder of leadership. Um, th that allows those board officers to chair the various committees and chair the work session before they actually have to take over chairing the board. That is not guaranteed for any board officer, however, except for the vice chair automatically moves to the chair. Um, so that's, that's our role. Um, we were blessed with a number of qualified applicants, and I want to sincerely thank everybody who is willing to throw their name in the hat to take on the extra role of being a board officer. It's not an insignificant uh, duty of time, so thank you for being willing to be considered. Um, after a robust and thorough discussion, the nominating committee has the following slate of board officers that we would like to bring to you tonight for your consideration. And that's um, for Chair Herb Atchison, who automatically ascends, for Vice Chair Bob Pfeiffer, for Secretary John Dyack, and those are again all three existing board officers, and then as the new board officer on the slate for Treasurer uh, Ashley Stolzman. And then Bob Roth would automatically become the immediate past chair. So with that, I would like to put a motion on the table that the board, I move that the board approve the slate as recommended by the nominating committee. We have a motion and a second to approve the slate of officers for this coming year. Discussion? Director Brockman. Excellent choices. Brock. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, uh, Director Partridge. Uh, I was wondering, De Director Atchison, were you going to make some comments? I have actually a comment, but I will actually, I wanted to see if you were going to make some comments and I'll have a comment. Okay. Uh, during the process, the board officer became aware of a question of conflict. So none of us know where people work, and typically that's not an issue. The question came up, we have discussed this not only with CDOT, uh, their representative here tonight can speak for herself. We've uh, run this past the AG as of today. We have run this past the board legal representative, Mr. Light. The, also the municipal uh, where this individual comes from is there may be occasions that one of the uh, slate members 
may need to recuse themselves at some point if there's a perceived or real conflict of interest. They know what they're supposed to conflict themselves out of. But because there is nothing in our bylaws that cover conflicts of interest, we are going to assign to the P&E committee to go back into our bylaws and update those so that we have a way to address either perceived or real conflicts of interest and in how a board director needs to conduct that issue. So that is going to be an assignment to P&E starting tomorrow, depending upon the election going on as it is proposed tonight. But we've recognized that. We have vetted the issue. It came forward from the uh, nominating committee. And I personally, uh, after having talked to the groups that are supporting uh, this, I think we have come with a resolution. I've talked to Mr. Partridge. I've talked to the chair of the nominating committee. I've talked to the attorneys. I have also discussed it with CDOT and the individual in question being Mr. Pfeiffer, that we are perfectly safe in proceeding on in the direction we're going with the recommended slate but we do need to tighten up some potential issues in our bylaws for the future. Mr. Partridge. Director Partridge. Thank you, Director Axson and Mr. Chair. And I have to say it was a, a real challenge all the way through, certainly. And, and I will tell you, first of all, when I really consider this a very personal matter. So uh, Director Pfeiffer and I did meet about this personally because it, it's just a, a sensitive issue. <laughs> there was only two of us. <laughs> so it, it, it was a pretty serious discussion because one thing I don't think we take lightly is conflict of interest. And so uh, Director Pfeiffer had, had a pretty robust discussion on that, certainly had a robust discussion with some others. And I appreciate Director Axson and the executive board taking this up. I would say even though I think we do still have some loose ends, no doubt, obviously we do. I feel comfortable w with the process has gone through at this point, and, and I think Director Pfeiffer is very aware of the potential and real conflict of interest arise, and I, I trust him as an individual that he'll uh, take the position of Dr. Cog as he sits in that position as either vice chair and eventually chair. So with that, I would just like to say, I certainly think we have a, an excellent slate before, before us, and I do support it. Other questions or comments? Deborah Perkins-Smith. So as, as the CDOT representative, um, I'd like to address that. So I knew there were some questions, so I did talk to our AG. Um, and just in full transparency, you actually have three, just three CDOT employees in the room. And I am a CDOT employee, and I represent CDOT. Um, the other two employees actually represent their local jurisdictions. Um, and they are under no ethical obligation to CDOT because they are not representing CDOT. I am. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, and then our AG did go on to remind me, because I sit on multiple boards myself, um, including my homeowners association. <laughs> she, she, did, she, <laughs> she did remind me that, um, and this is true for every person in this room, that although you have a, um, what's called a rules of conduct, your rules of conduct actually refers to the state statute. And in state statute, it says members that have a direct or substantial financial inter interest, um, basically you should recuse yourself. So um, that applies to everyone in this room, not just the seat on employees. So um, my AG reminded me of that, and so um, I will monitor the situation, but it's really up to them how they vote in terms of their jurisdiction, so. Other questions or comments? See none, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions. All right, so as my last item as the chair, um, I wanted to recognize a few people. First of all, Elise Jones is going off the executive committee after many years of faithful service. She, <laughs> she, uh, she mentioned in her nominating report that it is not an insignificant amount of extra time. There are uh, more hours put in on the executive board, and Elise has always done a wonderful job, and we will miss her leadership, so I want to acknowledge Elise. <laughs> so
Secondly, I wanted to acknowledge and congratulate Ashley Stolzman. I don't know if it's congratulations or condolences, but <laughs> welcome to the Executive Committee. I know that you'll do a wonderful job. So welcome. And with that, I'm going to yield the gavel to our new chair, Herb Atchison. Are we ready to adjourn? <laughs> I thought Bob got all the business taken care of before he dumped on me. All right, moving along. Uh, next item of interest to all of us. Uh, is the starting of our guidelines for our regional sub-regional. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so we had a pretty good discussion about this at, a, at our work session a couple weeks ago. Um, so I'll, you know, in the issue, in the essence of time, I'll try to get through this as quickly as possible. But I would like to point out some points of, um, of clarification and a few revisions that the TIP Policy Work Group has made as a result of the discussion that you all had um, at the uh, work session a couple weeks ago. So we're talking about sub-regional form formation today. Um, really, what we'd like to get your action on today is, uh, you know, these foundational, these foundational concepts, right, associated with the governance and the uh, formation of the, um, of the subregions. Um, I won't go into any detail with that because you've seen that as many times as I have. So let's start with uh, subregional form membership and decision making process. So as, as, we, as we discussed, um, so these subregional forms, they're an extension of Dr. Cog's governance. And as a result, um, we believe in part of, and part of the TIP Policy Work Group's proposal is that at a minimum, all Dr. Cog member governments, municipal, county, municipal and county government entities with corporate limits wholly or partially within a subregion would be invited to participate. So those communities that are, that are wholly within one, one, one county, that's going to be pretty easy for you. For those that, um, that are within multiple counties, um, you have the option of participating in any one of those or all of them, right? So, for example, Aurora, for example, is uh, um, they're in three counties. They have the uh, they, they have the opportunity. They will be formally invited to participate in all three, but they may choose not to. Right? It's up to them. Um, so, uh, I wanted to point that out. So, the the, the big difference. Um, you know, well, it's not a big difference. We talked about this last time at the work session that it is indeed the corporate limits, right? So if a community owns property in a county but their corporate limits do not extend into that county, they would not be invited for membership, at least not as part of that bullet, okay? And uh, we talked about that at, sub at the TIP Policy Work Group and we were all in agreement with that. Um, each entity uh, who, who decides to participate uh, we'll designate a, an elected official to, or, or a designee to serve on that sub-regional forum. Uh, we would e even go further to even suggest that um, just because of the issue and the complexity of what we're dealing with, that, they, that, that, that designee should have some understanding, whether it be the actual Dr. Cog representative or alternate. Um, we think, you know, we would encourage that, I think, just because you would have the most knowledge of, uh, of, of the process. Uh, the, now, this next bullet, this is a change. Um, we, we basically, you know, well, act, it's a change in, in, in the fact that we didn't indicate, um, you know, the voting structure. So the TIP Policy Work Group is recommending that e each form mem member would have one vote. So w each entity, one vote, as opposed to any kind of way weighted voting or anything like that. We just, it's basically is consistent with how we do business here at Dr. Cog. So we felt, felt that was appropriate. Now, with regards to quorum requirements and the like, um, we are, our recommendation is to leave that up to uh, each subregion and how they want to pursue that, whether that be quorum would be, you know, half of those, half of the, uh, the, the uh, local governments that are on the forum, um, how you determine action items, whether that's just a simple majority or a, a majority of those present in voting, you know, whatever it might be. So that, that will be left up to the subregions to, to determine. RTD and CDOT um, shall be invited as non-voting members. And um, last but not least, um, 
other non-Dr. Cog governmental entities may be invited to at the discretion of each subregion. So the distinction was made on this subregion for those that have membership on the, on the subregional forum is between Dr. Cog communities and other communities that are not Dr. Cog. Um, because again, this is an extension of Dr. Cog's governance, um, at, the, at minimum it should be the Dr. Cog members and it will be up to those members to make that determination of how you do that. Now this is also different than um, uh, let me just get to that page. So this is different than what was shown to you in the in the um, in the work session. We had also included other th it, besides non Dr. Cog governmental entities. We also included um, what we called other other regional participants, such as transportation management associations, chambers of commerce, universities. We gave as examples. The tip policy work group. When we talked about that more, we we didn't believe this part of our proposal that they should not be offered membership in the sub-regional forum, but would be eligible to participate as stakeholders. So what that really means is that they would be provided with uh, information on when the meetings are, they would be provided with, their, with a packet, they would be provided with, a, uh, you know, when solicitations for projects, call for projects, those types of things would be, would, would, uh, would be ongoing. So I'll give you an example. So for, for us at Dr. Cobb, when we send you out the board packets, we send, we have a separate email list that we send to just our board directors, and then we have another list for, you know, uh, interested, interested stakeholders, and we send those the information as well, but they won't have a formal seat at the table. Um, form structure, so we talked about if we do get um, some type of action from you all tonight on, on these concepts, that we want to formally uh, form those sub-regional forums. Um, so we, <laughs> I know, right? Good Lord. So we, um, so we, yeah, what we, so Dr. Cog will actually uh, send out formal invitations to everyone that's eligible to participate in those eight county-based forums, and uh, we will establish, we will work with staff within those counties to establish a meeting date and time, and then uh, we'll go forth from there. So Dr. Cog, we do anticipate that we will staff that initial meeting and go through some of the, you know, just some of the gymnastics associated with forming a committee. But after that, it will be left up to each sub-regional forum the level of involvement they want from Dr. Cog's staff. Now, we will attend every meeting um, in all the county-based forums, um, but it, um, there may be some counties um, that, that they may wish Dr. Cog to have a stronger role. And that's entirely up to you, but we wanted to throw that out there as an option for you all. So, yes, sir. Just this is more of a question. CDOT and RTD, that's a lot of meetings. Are you guys prepared to staff that? Because I can't, there's no way we can, can tell you when those are all going to happen. So from CDOT's perspective, we've had a discussion. So in general, um, there are different, so I would not be at all eight meetings if that's what you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> or I. Yeah. Well, we were going to start spending a lot a of time together. I might a of them. Um, but we do have staff that deal with those specific um, counties. And so I think the intent would be that they would continue to represent CDOT in that case. And, and for example, I would monitor that. But because they work closely with them and would be, have better knowledge, that that would probably be the best approach. Mr. Van Meter, same question. First, I've heard of the invitation or expectation, haven't had a chance to discuss it with my staff and formulate a plan. It would be my intent that to the extent possible, we would be at all meetings, though. Okay. Good. Great. Thank you. Oops, sorry. <coughs> wrong way. So, so, this, so everything we've talked about thus far is with regards to the membership of the forums, right? So now we're talking about who's eligible to submit projects or be considered to receive funding. So of course it would be all Dr. Cog local governments within that sub-regional forum. It would also include all local governments that are not Dr. Cog members. Those, they would be straight up eligible to submit. And then any other state or regional agency that's eligible to receive uh, federal funds directly. Um, and those may include state universities, the RAC, Regional Air Quality Council, um, and, and transportation management associations. Those are just examples, um, but I think it kind of, you know, covers the, you know, most of, uh, you know, what we've seen in the past. So just FYI. Um, on agenda uh, postings and notifications, we had a pretty pretty good discussion about this with Sam. Um, so 
right now, as currently proposed, uh, we are requesting that, um, that two things, that where whoever hosts the sub-regional forum meeting, so let's just say for sake of argument, Boulder County is held in Louisville, that they would follow their posting requirements and procedure for, for public meetings. We also request that, um, that you follow Dr. Cog's procedure. So basically, that you provide us with, uh, with the, the appropriate agenda packet information um, you know, in compliance with, with, our, with our procedures for posting. So we post it in, again, the binder in, the, in, the, in our um, main uh, lobby there, and we will also post it on our website. I would even suggest that we're, we're planning on having a separate web page for all those sub-regional forum meetings so we have them available so then we can have all the agendas historically and the, the sum, meeting summaries and all that kind of good stuff. Um, we also request that, um, that, the, um, that if you form formal subcommittees, whether that be like you know, a technical committee or something like that, that they, those meetings also follow the uh, meeting requirements that are listed above. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Pfeiffer. Uh, you know, on the posting requirements, wouldn't it, I just think it would make it better that all jurisdictions in the sub committee or sub region should be posting. Because, like in Jefferson County, if we held it in Arvada, then Lakewood folks may not get aware that we're meeting up in Arvada. Shouldn't we make all jurisdictions in the sub region post? Well, I mean, you, instead that's, of just that's, the hosting? I mean, that, that's entirely up to you guys. I, I, just, I just wonder if it'll get complicated quickly. On that, I mean, just just the logistics of that. I, 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 mean, I get the complication. I just I'm afraid that from the public's view, yeah. when they want an opportunity to weigh in, and a Lakewood citizen doesn't know that we're hosting it up somewhere else. Right. Uh, well, I don't know. I, I mean, I just, it'll be on I think the doctor. Think about that. Yeah, I mean, be on, on the Dr. Cog website. So hopefully, and our our logo will be included on the information, right? So hopefully, that would, you know. Never mind, we resolved it. She's taking care of it all. <laughs> oh, perfect. I'm in charge of that portion. Okay. Director Jones. I was just wondering if that could be more easily solved by having that county also posted, because we, we have to routinely post all of our meetings, and that would cover for all the jurisdictions in the county. Yeah, that's, that's not a bad idea. That would be idea. an easy resolution. <laughs> Any other comments or questions at this point? All right, Doug, go ahead. Two other points I just might uh, mention with regards to the posting of notifications, that all meetings are open to the public, of course. And um, we're also suggesting um, including an agenda item for public comment, like as we do on our, on our board packets, our board work session has that, as well as our technical committees and the like. Um, so I'd be interested to get your, get your thoughts and comments on that as well. Any comments? Not at this time. Last but not least is about the documentation. Um, you recall that in the, the, uh, the letter that FHWA gave us with regards to this, this whole process, that some of the, um, uh, just some of the parameters that they kind of set for that, that they, they wanted us to make sure that we document this pilot project as well as we can. So we will be reaching out to our member, you know, to those sub-regional sub forums to make sure we're in compliance with that. But the, probably the most important is ultimately the methodology you're going to use to select projects, right? So um, we have to make sure that we, uh, we, uh, we document that and to the satisfaction of FHWA. And that's it, I think, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to take any questions. Director Jones. Just a little clarification on methodology, because that word wasn't on the slide. You had said procedures. I'm just curious. Um, I assume that would include any additional criteria a subregion might apply to project selection in addition to the Dr. Cog criteria? That's correct. Yes. I, I would just a little extra on that. Um, you know, I know, you know, we're kind of basing our model, our template to some degree on Puget Sound Regional Council's um, concept. And, you know, they have four counties up there in their subregion, uh, four subregional forums. Um, I believe two of their counties use their regional criteria just straight up. Um, the other two counties use, um, you know, some reasonable facsimile of that. But the one thing that they, when we talked to staff up there, that they, they made sure is that even if they did change and did not use the regional criteria, that the major tenants, the major components of the, um, the sub-regional criteria 
or sorry, the major components of the regional criteria were included in the sub-regional. So for example, for us, it would be like the board focus areas you approved, right? Increase safety, increase reliability, increase access to vulnerable populations. Those would have to be included to some degree within your criteria, within the sub-regional criteria, as well as tenants of metro vision, consistency, consistency with the long-range plan, those types of things. But we'll, we'll uh, as we get further along, we'll be sure to provide more detail and information. Mr. Beacom? Being Broomfield County and the city of, we're a little bit different. Yes, and you I know are. You've commented a few times that there would be some direction on how we should proceed. I do realize that we need to comply with the notice and everything else on that, but it would be nice to know what staff thinks is the right way to move forward. Yes. No, thank you, sir, very much. And I should have mentioned that right from the outset. Although we have, you know, we have eight county-based sub-regional forums, there are two that are not like the others, right? Um, and actually, we had a meeting with, uh, with City County Denver staff yesterday to talk about some of those logistics and everything. So we are, we are working on getting a meeting with Broomfield staff right now to just talk about just the stuff in general. But you are different. There's no doubt about that. But, but, it, <laughs> but it's a, but. And David, that was not a dig. <laughs> But, it, I mean, but because of that, I think, you know, we have to be really conscious of the transparency that's involved with setting up your process. And, and we're conscious of that, and we will, we'll, we'll be talking about it more. So stay tuned. Ms. Wall. You mentioned two. Are you thinking Denver and Broomfield? Yes. And what about Weld? Well, Weld County has multiple jurisdictions within their sub-regional forum. So that would be invited to, okay. Yep. Any other comments or questions at this time? Mr. Pfeiffer? If there's not any questions, I'll make the motion. Please do. As presented. As, I was going to read it because I know John Dyack wants me to read the motions. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and read it. Uh, move to approve uh, found, uh, foundational governance con concepts for the sub-regional form formation. Man, there's a lot of weird words in that one. <laughs> to be included in the 2020-2023 uh, TIP policy document. Man. I have Dr. a motion Zeus. and a second without the damn, there's a lot of words in <laughs> Sorry. Mr. Chairman? Are there any? Yes, Mr. Hey, can I ask for clarification? Um, I know we talked about this concept of the, um, the county also posting in addition to the host if they're not the host. Is that something that you would recommend be included in that? I, just, so I would add that to the motion. And who was the second? Okay. Mr. Flynn, you're okay with the add-on? Okay, I have an okay. We have this as amended. We have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions? All those in favor, please signify by aye. aye. Any opposed? Are there any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion is carried. Thank you. Mr. Morrow, you're up. Well done, Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everybody. Am I on? Yeah. I have uh, the next three agenda items, I believe, but they should be actually fairly quick. Um, the first one is, uh, I think it's attachment E, agenda item 12, page 32 if you're online. And this is uh, approval of the 2018 policy statement on federal legislative issues. Uh, we um, staff uh, presented this to the board last month and, and um, for your comment or your staff's comments and in bringing it back this month for approval. I did not receive any comments or questions about uh, the statement, so we're back here this month uh, asking uh, for a motion to approve the uh, policy statement. Any comments or questions? If not, could I have a motion? Mr. Dyack? Um, uh, Director Rakowski, I think, has a question. Probably have to do the motion. You're moving. Okay, I have a, I have a motion, Mr. Dyack. Yeah. Um, uh, to, to honor Director Pfeiffer, uh, I yeah. th the move to adopt the. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Can you second it first? Oh, oh, second. I've got the motion. Oh, sorry. You're second. 
He, he didn't read the motion, he though. So I think that. Director Pfeiffer needs to have the motion <laughs> read. Mr. Rakowski is, is a much more astute at these. So I'm, I'm giving him a lot of benefit. He doesn't have to read. Plus, I, I will uh, bend to the man who's been here longer than I have. <laughs> so I have a motion. Mr. Dyack, are you the second? I have a motion and a second. Is there any questions or comments on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, Mr. Morrow, you have your motion. All right, thank you. Uh, the next one is uh, just the updated status of bills that you took positions on last month. Um, I can give you a quick update. Um, some of them are already dead. Uh, but the first one on, uh, I think it's on page 56, it's uh, Senate Bill 54. You may, may recall the conversation on that. Uh, as that bill was introduced, uh, we opposed it because it would have restricted the health department from increasing fees on assisted living residences that are necessary to implement new regulations that have just been passed. Uh, we also discussed amending that bill because the, uh, Dr. Cog and the, the department were working with the sponsors to allow the, an opportunity for the department to do a one-time fee increase and then join the rest of the health facilities that future fee increases would only be by inflation. Uh, we were successful in getting that amendment on the bill and so with that, as I think we had discussed last month, be willing to uh, move uh, to a position of just monitor on that bill. And so with that, I'd request, if unless there are any questions or concerns, I'd request that, uh, a motion to uh, move to a uh, monitor position on the bill as amended. Okay, any questions? Can I have a motion, please? So Mr. Pfeiffer? So moved. so moved for moving from opposed to monitor. Is there a second? second? I have a motion and a second. Is there any comments or questions on this one? All those in favor, please aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Um, and thank you. And so there's updates on the rest of them. The only ones that have changed since the agenda went out was uh, Senate Bill 7 on, uh, let's see, page 4 of the attachment, page 58 of your packet. Uh, that is now, uh, it passed out of Senate appropriations, is now on the Senate floor. Uh, and we expect that to pass soon and move over to the House. Um, on the next page, Senate Bill 10 passed out of uh, Senate local government. Uh, it was double assigned, so it's passed to the, um, oh, no, I'm sorry, it passed all the way out of the Senate and has been assigned to the House Finance Committee. So we expect that one also to continue to pass. Um, if there are not any questions on last month's bills, I can take you to this month's bills which already only a week since we put this in the packet have fa fared less well than last month's bills. Um, I think we've already had like, what is it, I counted three of them that are already been postponed indefinitely since. <laughs> so, we, um, so first of all, the first one uh, is uh, House Bill 1072, the red light camera uh, repeal. Um, that one was postponed indefinitely, or killed as we say, last week. Uh, so we can take that off the list. Uh, the very next bill, House Bill 1119, which was sort of the uh, companion bill to Senate Bill 1, which we monitored last month. Uh, Senate, uh, House Bill 1119 was uh, PI'd in uh, uh, House Transportation just this afternoon. Uh, so that one's done. Then, let's see, I think that takes us to House Bill 1125, which is a tax credit for um, employer-assisted housing. It's a pilot program, mainly for employers. I think it's really given the sponsor from uh, mountain areas of, of the state intended uh, for uh, employers in, in that areas of the state. Um, 
this it does I don't know that it really affects Dr. Cog, but we're we're kind of keeping a, a close eye on a lot of the or on all of the affordable housing bills this year. So I did want to put it on the list, and are just recommending that we monitor it for now. Uh, this, a similar bill was introduced by the same sponsor last year, and was was uh, uh, was did not pass. Uh, they ran out of time, actually. But um, anyway, so I'm recommending a monitor position on that bill. Should we take them one by one? Let's just take them as a vote. We'll see. Is there any questions on this one before we move on to the next one? Okay. We'll take them. We've only, I think, got three left. So, right. <laughs> so far. Uh, the mm -hmm. next one is uh, House Bill 1127, uh, which Ooh. is uh, um, re relates to uh, for. Uh, Landlord tenant issues. The, it puts some restrictions on uh, um, accumulation of uh, application fees uh, that renters have to pay. Uh, there have been uh, some horror stories, if you will, of, of uh, people applying uh, to uh, rent at, at uh, various different uh, facilities that end up paying hundreds of dollars just in application fees and this is an attempt to um, put the, put that in some some check uh, the bill is passed out of the house finance and is uh, waiting second reading on the house floor and I'm recommending uh, a position of support on that bill and then the next bill is uh, house bill 1195 which um, some folks are calling it the Habitat for Humanity bill, but it's essentially would allow a uh, tax credit for uh, actually nonprofit organizations that provide affordable housing. And um, that one, uh, at this point in time, just recommending a monitor position. Uh, it's in House Finance Committee and hasn't been calendared yet. And finally, on the last page, Senate Bill 120, uh, unfortunately, I was recommending we support that bill, but it's already been uh, postponed indefinitely in committee, so we don't need to take that one up. So to recap, we've got um, House Bill 1125 for monitor, House Bill 1127 for support, and House Bill 1195 for monitor. Okay. Can I have a motion from the floor to support staff recommendation on these three bills, Mr. Flynn? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'll move that we uh, uh, adopt the positions on the bills presented other than the ones that have been PI. Okay. Do I have a second? I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on any of the three bills or the positions proposed by staff? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? I have one, two abstentions. That'd be Mr. Partridge and Ms. Stoltzman, I think it was. Okay, motion is carried. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, if I may have one more minute. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to announce a couple other issues for you. Uh, I've talked before uh, about the uh, budget request that Dr. Cog spearheaded um, actually last fall that resulted in the governor including in his budget request a four million dollar statewide increase for uh, state funding for senior services and this is funding that goes to the area agencies on aging all around the state. Dr. Cog is the largest. Uh, that one uh, is going to be before that request is going to be before the Joint Budget Committee for a final decision on March 7th and um, myself and, and our contract lobbyists uh, Ed Bowditch and, and Jennifer Castle who's in the back of the room uh, Ed would be here except he's homesick uh, are, um, will be a, uh, We've been working on that issue all session and, and we'll be touching base with the Joint Budget Committees in, over the next couple weeks to make sure uh, that that uh, request is approved. Uh, we're very confident that it will be, so I look forward to reporting back to you on that next month. Um, and, the, and the last thing I wanted to mention is that we've also been working with Dr. Cog's staff on putting on a legislative breakfast 
for uh, House and Senate members uh, at the state capitol. That'll be two days later than that on March 9th. And um, it's one, one of those things that a lot of groups do down at the capitol just to introduce themselves to the legislators and that sort of thing. And so we decided to uh, try that this year. Um, I'm real anxious to see what our staff are, uh, come up with. Uh, our staff in communications and marketing and regional planning are, are putting together, I think, some really informative uh, posters and computer simulations and so forth. So I just wanted to let you guys know that we're working on that as well. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Morrow. Mr. Calvert, you're up next. I'm going to wake Chuck up, right? <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, uh, uh, Director Atchison. Um, so Brad Calvert, I'm the Director of the Regional Planning and Development Division here at Dr. Cog. And this, the agenda item calls this a high-level overview, really, of kind of what Dr. Cog and our partners have been up to in terms of implementing the MetroVision plan since it was adopted about a year ago, last January. Uh, in this case, high-level is code for I'm going to cover a lot of stuff pretty quickly. Um, the thing, I'm happy to have a discussion once this presentation is over, but I would even more want to encourage you to say, to ask yourself, did I hear something that I just want to learn more about, that Brad hit a 45 second version of something that is worth your time either, either as an individual director for more um, education and learning around a particular thing that we're working on, or if it feels like something that you as a group um, want to hear more about, because I just wanted to sort of superficially hit a lot of the things that, that we've been working on um, since this board took action um, on the MetroVision plan uh, about a year ago. Um, so just for those, I and mean, I also, uh, it was at your table, we are having a short course on sort of the MetroVision plan and kind of how we support uh, both local planning and regional planning here at Dr. Cog on, on March 15th. So I would certainly encourage you, if you want a refresher on this, more background, all those sorts of things, please uh, come and spend some, some time with us. For, but for those that were not around for the five years uh, that we worked on uh, the plan, and we, that means you in this group, that means the public, that means staff, that means all sorts of folks uh, that weighed in on that, that vision plan that you all adopted um, a year ago. We are now on the sort of right-hand side of this graphic. So the board took action to approve the plan unanimously, which is always great. Uh, in January of last year, um, we are now kind of in the implementation phase. Um, I don't have a slide, but for instance, one of the first things that you see is developing a robust uh, a web presence for the plan. We've done that. Um, those are the, just the types of things that you, that you do these days. Um, we are now sort of in the evaluation, measurement, reporting phase, helping um, communities uh, with, through assistance, uh, that sort of thing. I hope in probably two or three months we'll come and give you kind of a first round of updates on performance measures. Uh, the plan includes 16 regional plan performance measures that the board spent a fair amount of time talking about. It would be hard to have a conversation about performance measures and initiatives and not take up 50 minutes, so I want to do this conversation now to sort of give you a view of what we've been up to as, as Dr. Cog's staff, uh, but then, and then come back in a few months to talk a little bit about sort of observations about how we're doing um, as a region based on the performance measures that the board um, set as part of that plan. Uh, another quick sort of orientation, um, the plan is sort of broken up into five uh, themes. Uh, the main thing that I wanted to point out in this slide is the last two, um, healthy, inclusive, and livable communities and a vibrant regional economy are actually new in this version of MetroVision. Uh, MetroVision as a, as a guiding plan for this region and this organization has existed um, since 1997. Uh, but the board spent a lot of time on these um, latter two issues, including forming um, ad hoc groups to explore these issues and try to figure out how exactly they would fit into uh, the region's plan. You probably have seen this before as well, many of you. Sometimes it's green, uh, but in this case it's purple. Um, and it, so I'm not trying to mix you up. Um, it's just an overview of our overall strategic planning um, approach that we use here at Dr. Cog. And what I'm really doing is focusing on the, the bottom line of this, our initiatives that we obviously work on to try to achieve the outcomes that the board set uh, through the planning processes. And as I mentioned, I'll come back hopefully in April, maybe May, to sort of talk to you about performance measures uh, and targets. So the mo you will more routinely hear about these sort of uh, latter two items. At some point, you should have a conversation. Is, are you hearing anything that suggests we need to talk about outcomes and objectives? But we really will be reporting uh, on measures and initiatives uh, more routinely with you. 
Uh, another thing to sort of keep in mind, um, you know, we think of the Metro Vision Plan as a shared guiding vision of, uh, for the Board of Directors um, and a set of outcomes, objectives, initiatives that are shared uh, across the region. We think of it very much as aspirational and long range in focus. Um, and really, the last bullet is, is critically important. I am here to talk to you about what Dr. Cog has been up to. But we alone cannot achieve the outcomes that the board set in the Metro Vision Plan. It takes stakeholders from around uh, the region to be able to do that, including uh, your communities um, as well. Uh, and so I did want to mention that I'm talking to you about regional initiatives. Uh, I think I'm hitting maybe 12 or 15 high level. Do think of, and I'm, that, I'm giving you an illustrative list, not a comprehensive list. So there are hundreds of things happening around the region that the way I think of it is are like, hey, that's MetroVision, things that are happening in local communities that are ultimately furthering um, the vision for the region that you've established as a board, whether that is uh, new park space or thinking about how the arts can become, create um, vibrant um, urban centers, whether it's new first and final mile connections to transit. You all are doing great work around the region to really further not only your local plans, but the region's plan as well. So certainly a big thank you uh, for all the work that you do. And one of the things that we do at um, the award celebration that, that Doug mentioned is recognize some innovative local practices. And frankly, Rich and I both um, have experienced over the past few years that those have gotten really good. And our judges often struggle with coming up with, a, with to go from 30 to five uh, to recognize it's tough because you all are doing such great work. Uh, so I'm going to orient this um, presentation around um, uh, a series of outcomes. The plan includes 14 outcomes. I'm only going to cover six just to kind of give you, again, a high-level way of orienting kind of some things that we've um, worked on. Uh, there is an outcome in the plan um, that's, that, that states the region is comprised of diverse uh, livable communities. Um, so one pr initiative that's actually about five years in the making but has really picked up steam recently is something called the Boomer Bond. Uh, this is really where we work with local communities for, to help you understand how you can become a more, more age-friendly place. Our region is aging dramatically, um, and it is a very difficult thing for, for local governments to wrestle with what that means, what are the implications, and that's all the way from public works and infrastructure and housing issues all the way to, like, even human resources. You know, I, I've heard a stat something like 30 to 40 percent of local government staff across the country are eligible for retirement in the next five years. Right, so as you see that sort of brain drain locally, how do you think about it from a human resources perspective to keep them uh, engaged? So I'm sure folks are aware of this, but even, even better yet, a lot of communities around uh, the table have actually worked with Dr. Cog on this. We're up to, we're up to, up to 17 communities um, that have used the assessment tool, but 2017 really was a banner year for us. Um, we worked in seven communities um, over the course of uh, 2017 to complete uh, assessments. We worked in Idaho Springs, Decono, Frederick, Federal Heights, Sheridan, Bennett, Denver, and Broomfield. So think of those pla very different places, whole different sets of issues, um, all those sorts of things. Um, and, and we were fortunate to actually have some financial support through the Department of Local Affairs to support particularly the work that we did in some of the, some of the smaller communities. And I, I will just tell you that we think this is a value add uh, for our members, but I will just tell you my staff loves this. This is their, this is their favorite thing uh, that they work on is to work with you and your communities and your community stakeholders to understand how you can think through this issue and proactively address um, what really is an opportunity uh, more so uh, than a challenge. Oh, yeah, so, sorry, <laughs> Jayla, too. Uh, that, is, so that is a cross-functional team, so thank you, Jayla. Um, another thing that we've been working on that, again, is really in, in service uh, to, our, to our members is we do a lot of cool, sophisticated sort of computer stuff uh, for, for an easy way to describe it. One of those is running a regional land use model to understand how the region is going to change over, over time as we add 1.2 million people. Where are they going to live? Where are they going to work? How are they going to travel? That's the types of things that we try to um, help understand so that we can obviously provide that information to you so that you can make uh, really informed decisions. We've been trying to work through, well, how does that, can we extract value from those tools at the local level? Uh, specifically thinking about urban centers around the region that are really thinking about how they transition in their development cycle to maybe medium density, density to higher density or a place that maybe is not that developed right now but actually intends to develop at a relatively um, urban scale. So we've created uh, a, a tool that we call Scenario Manager uh, to help communities um, work through uh, that conversation uh, to really kind of understand the policy, some of the policy levers that you have uh, control of locally to understand how that would impact the development future 
um, of that community, right? So we've worked with Inglewood, Arvada, and Aurora on this very specifically, and Denver, to some degree, we ended up sort of providing a slightly uh, different ser uh, service on this, but, but, but really um, pretty similar. So it allows, the way the tool is, is, is um, developed, you can change assumptions about how much rent a developer can get if they build a certain type of product. You can change the parking requirements. That's oftentimes one of the things that we find that it's hard for development to pencil if they actually have to meet the parking requirements they may, that they may see as, as too high. You lower that, you get a lot more potential for development yield, and you may see the type of development um, that really you're trying to get, um, particularly in sort of those urban center uh, locations. Uh, this is something that you will hear more about in 2018, but there's a lot of groundwork that was laid in 2017 that we really call sort of the Regional um, Growth Initiative. This is just how Dr. Cog, local communities, and other stakeholders talk about growth and ultimately mitigate uh, the negative impacts and accentuate the positives that can come uh, with growth in our region. Again, adding 1.2 million people over the next 25 years is a challenge also an opportunity. So how do we work with each other to understand how your local plans, priorities, and assumptions can inform what we do at Dr. Cog? And ultimately, that turns into information that you can use as you make uh, decisions as the board of directors. And then hopefully through that process, you learn a lot about regional issues in your own community that may inform um, how you make uh, decisions as well. So I won't belabor this. Uh, you'll see this at least twice, probably the next, in the first half uh, of this year. Um, one other thing that you actually took action on back in, in August of last year are in the, in the, in the sort of tip world, uh, what we call set-asides off the top, however you want to think about it, sort of programmatic elements um, that are identified in, in the tip. And I really wanted to use this as an example of how um, I use the MetroVision plan. I had it with me earlier. You should see my hard copy. It's tattered. I take it with me um, everywhere. Um, Previously, under the last tip, we had something funding that the board had set aside for urban center and stationary master planning. Um, clearly, that was an important part of the growth and development side of the MetroVision plan. But the plan and still emphasizes that, but diversified a little bit in terms of the types of community planning that it wanted to support and it wanted to emphasize. So as staff was reflecting on, well, what would the set aside look like in the future, those are the types of things that we think through. So and while the final eligibility for um, this program has not been determined, we really wanted to write a set aside that gave a lot more flexibility to the types of planning and planning studies that could be uh, pursued throughout the region. So that's just so you know how we use it. You, you've given us sort of a guiding document, and we reflect on it almost any time we're bringing something uh, forward to you. Uh, so moving forward to kind of the, um, the transportation element um, of the plan, um, I think I'm really covering just one here. And I think almost everything I'm going to talk about in this section you've seen before, so I'm just going to hit it high level. I just thought sort of the context of how this stuff works together might be interesting um, to hear. Um, just in the past, I don't know if it was last month or the month before, um, you heard about the updated congestion report um, that we've been uh, working on. Um, because obviously there are actually two performance me measures related to congestion um, in the plan. The thing that I think is that I want to emphasize on this slide and that we were talked about it, um, you talked about it as the board is we're working a lot with CDOT to understand how to get to better data. And so if, if, if you just wanted to tune me out and the only words you wanted to hear over and over again were collaboration and partnership, that's really what our work is about these days. Everything is ultimately working uh, with other folks, whether it's your member communities, whether it's CDOT, whether it's RTD, whether it's other, other stakeholders. Um, so this is something that you've seen recently, something you took action on last month um, were new safety targets. Um, this is also something that required a lot of coordination uh, with CDOT. Um, I was very pleased um, when you actually finished this item uh, Chairman Roth at the time just sort of said thank you because he recognized that this body spent five years thinking about MetroVision and it's very clear that, that those conversations live on through what staff does and what they bring forward to the board and that was exactly right. This is the type of work that we can continue to do um, really to meet um, the outcomes that you, that you establish in the plan. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention on the transportation side in particular is whether you see it or not, we are actively working with your staff and in your communities every single day on all, to all types of projects, whether that is putting funding on the street uh, for technology improvements um, to sort of your, to your infrastructure, to uh, traffic signal coordination projects throughout the region, uh, to serving on as technical resources on big transportation studies that are happening around the region. If there's a transportation study happening in your, in your community about a potential investment, there's a good chance that Dr. Cog's staff is supporting uh, that in some way. And we've also uh, have a, uh, recently uh, did a call for the transportation demand management set aside um, as well. 
And then I wanted to hit two, uh, I think it's two, maybe three, 2018 initiatives that will come through the board, but I think everyone recognizes just because we call, we call something a 2008 activity, that probably means there was a lot of foundational work that was laid um, in 2017. Uh, so it's important to recognize that. So we are currently working um, as a region on an active transportation plan uh, for the entire, uh, entire region uh, to really think about the product to support a robust um, active transportation network uh, throughout the region. Any number of reasons um, why to do that, this slide just kind of hits on two. If you look at the, at the trips throughout the region, there are a lot of trips that are less than five miles that are actually candidates to be converted from auto transit to maybe bike and ped or bike, ped and transit, or there's, there's, there's the ability to convert those trips to, to other uses, which, which our plan in some ways um, calls for. And then what you see on the bottom of the slide is um, bicycles, bicyclists and pedestrians are also overrepresented when it comes to serious injuries and fatalities. Um, when it comes to crashes, which obviously you all have spent some time talking about over the last few months. So it's very critical to take that issue importantly and make sure that the system is pro providing safe passage uh, for those travelers. Another thing that the board has spent some time on um, last year, and if I'm sure Doug had field any questions on this, is the Mobility Choice Blueprint, a uh, partnership between CDOT, uh, RTD, Dr. Cog, and the Metro Chamber to really sort of understand mobility and technology and how those things interact into the future. This work plan shows you a lot of things in 2018. Again, that means a lot of things happen in 2017 to get to the point where the mobility choice blueprint can be delivered um, by the end of the year. Clearly, we did it with Doug and, and Deb, and I'm sure others uh, spent lots of time thinking about this uh, to gear up for all the work that's going to happen this year, and I'm sure this, this board will see uh, this work probably a few times um, over the course of the next year. Um, there's also an outcome in the, in the plan uh, that refers to sort of the natural and built environment supporting healthy and active choices. This is one of those issues that existed in the previous plan, but really the board highlighted and, and I think strengthened um, in, the, in the adopted uh, plan. Um, one of the things that happened during the plan development process is Dr. Cog staff spent a lot of time cultivating and probably creating really uh, successful relationships with public health agencies around the around the region, which we didn't really necessarily have before, or or they were in their sort of um, early form, um, and so that partnership has only strengthened now that we've gotten to the to the implementation phase. Uh, we actually worked with all the sort of folks listed on the slide, as well as a few others that I just simply ran out of room, to to uh, submit a grant application to the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Unfortunately, we weren't successful on that, but but really it just solidified the work that we're doing. Um, and trying to come together and figure out how Dr. Cog, um, as well as these partners, can support really data that can, that can, that can help support better decision making, recognize how public health, um, how interventions and built environment solutions are impacting um, health around the region and to sort of amplify the learnings of each individual organization as they're, as they're working on initiatives uh, locally. So this is, there's still more to come in, in here and really kind of getting to the implementation phase of the plan has really uh, strengthened uh, our ability to work with, with these folks and frankly to come up with, with projects and initiatives. Um, you know, it, I think uh, oftentimes I serve as the voice and face of MetroVision. Um, everyone at Dr. Cog is working on MetroVision. I mean, that's just the reality. You hear from Steve Erickson and his team, his way to go team on what they're doing. That's, that's implementing MetroVision. That, that is thinking about how uh, we think through um, the ability to provide tra transportation and travel choice to um, commuters and other folks um, around the region every single day. That's clearly a part um, of the MetroVision plan. Um, obviously, you've probably heard about the Way to Go, uh, Go-tober um, event that occurred in uh, October. I think the second year, Steve, is that right? Second year of this and expanded tremendously over the first year. Obviously, Bike to Work Day is a, is a pretty significant thing that we work on every single year. I think a lot of times you see these and think these are kind of, these are big visible events. Steve and his team day in and day out are out there talking to folks about how they can think about commute alternatives. And sometimes it maybe gets lost when you just think of the really big uh, events that, that, that happen and that we obviously share um, results for. So that's why I wanted to put a slide in here that just talks about the impact of, of all the programs that, that, that the way to go um, folks work on. Um, we obviously have a, a, a goal in the plan to reduce vehicle miles traveled in the region, and they have demonstrable, measurable results related with all of their programs that actually is contributing to that. Um, some of these you've heard of, some of, some of them you haven't. The one that I just caught me when I prepared the slide is 
uh, the school pool program. I mean, hugely successful, not only giving parents and, and, and children options of how they, how they get to school, but having VNP um, uh, reductions uh, as well. So lots of things that they do that are really um, in advancement of, of the plan that you all adopted last year. Uh, one of the things that would, was added to the plan that was really interesting is this idea of expanding connections to health services uh, throughout the region. Um, you know, when you hear from Jayla, you understand that for 40 years, Dr. Cog has been working to connect residents in the region to community-based services. Uh, but Jayla will also tell you we have to do more. And if, that, that, if she has four words, she says is have to, we have to do more. That's really um, her mantra, and we are. She is constantly um, thinking about how to do that. One um, uh, way that we've been doing that in the past year is through our Accountable Health Communities uh, grant. Uh, we received four and a half million dollars from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare uh, to understand how to bridge the oftentimes gap between the clinical setting and the community setting uh, because there are a lot of things that happen at home that ultimately impact your health outcomes. And so we are very fortunate to be working in communities throughout the region to help both our clinical partners and our community-based partners work with each other uh, to ultimately improve health outcomes and connect people to services they need to improve their lives. Um, and so this is establishing best practice, not just for our region, but for the country um, over the next five years of this demonstration project. We are working with partners sort of around the region with Dr. Cog sort of serving as the hub and the core of, of the learning and the sort of data exchange associated with, again, connecting clinical partners with, with community partners. Uh, similar work um, with uh, UC Health as a primary partner um, in terms of, again, connecting people to the things in their lives outside of a healthcare setting that ultimately impact health outcomes. The thing I love about this slide are, are, the, are the goals of the project that we're working on with UC Health. Uh, increase and maintain self-reported client satisfaction. That just simply means make sure people are healthier. Reduce the workload on our clinical partners and decrease the cost of care. So better health out outcomes, less work for clinical partners, and cheaper. What's, what's, what's wrong with that, right? And those are the types of things that we're obviously um, working with folks to try to, try to do. Um, one other new program uh, is we are now the state health insurance, uh, a state health insurance assistance program, uh, specifically for Douglas, Arapahoe, and Jefferson counties. And this is simply to help people uh, that are Medicare eligible connect uh, with, with those programs so they understand what their eligibility is, what benefits they're entitled to, resolve disputes, all those sorts of things. So we are directly connecting people to um, health services. Um, on the sort of natural resource parks, open space, trails um, side of things, you actually heard uh, from this group back in October as part of a strategic, strategic informational briefing. Um, we've become active with the Metro Denver Nature uh, Alliance. You can see a bunch of logos on here. There's even more uh, folks uh, involved there. Um, I'm actually serving on their interim steering committee. They're a group that's been working together for four or five years, but it's not really all the way there as an organization yet. So for instance, they're actively hiring a new executive director. They have a sort of a business plan in place and they have several initiatives uh, coming up uh, for later this year and into next, including uh, sort of a regional vision and aspiration for parks, open space, and how people connect to them uh, throughout the region. So Dr. Cog is happy to be um, at that table, particularly given its connection to the outcome I just talked about. Um, and I think this is the final one. Um, investments in infrastructure and amenities allow people and businesses to thrive and prosper. Um, obviously, you've probably heard of this thing called the Transportation Improvement Program. Uh, there is still lots of work to do, but lots of things happened in 2017. It obviously happened around this table. Um, your staff have been invaluable in that process. I think between the TIP Policy Work Group and the Work Group before, they're up to like 37 meetings. I mean, it, it is a lot of time that they have spent ultimately helping you uh, get to a point where you can make policy decisions around how we invest um, those transportation dollars. So again, at your workshop, you spent a lot of time thinking through focus areas um, associated with, with this TIP to really kind of help you understand how to evaluate how successful you've been in terms of uh, the investments that you uh, support uh, through your uh, role as, as the board. Um, and then we do a lot kind of on the, on the research and data side that I thought was maybe interesting to share um, as well. Um, in some ways, you think of infrastructure as, as hard stuff. Increasingly, data is infrastructure, right? If people make decisions about hard infrastructure or decisions that they make, data is oftentimes um, at the center of that. So we spend a lot of time thinking about those issues and supporting both regional and local um, stakeholders. Uh, so for instance, one thing that we uh, produce is something called our Planometrics Project, which is a hard name to interpret, but really it's just sort of an inventory of sort of built environment features 
um, around the region that allow people to do all sorts of nifty planning and infrastructure work, whether it's uh, we've had folks use our data to create a mobile app to help the visually impaired navigate uh, streets around Denver. Uh, we've had a lot of emergency services uh, folks um, use this data to, to create emergency services plans, um, lots, of, lots for economic development, de uh, determining where sidewalk investments um, are needed, um, that sort of thing. So those are kind of regional data sets. But then we also um, have supported in 2017 a lot of closer to ad hoc or one-off uh, things to support uh, partners. So we worked. Um, to uh, do a literature review on the effects of investing in bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure on, on neighborhoods and health outcomes. Um, who benefits from those investments? Can you, can you, can you demonstrate health outcomes and other, other things like that? Um, one other thing that we completed recently in partnership with Denver Public Schools is to help DPS understand, wow, Denver has added 100,000 people in the last 10 years. How is that going to impact enrollment? How does the new buildings that have come online going to impact enrollment in the future? So that they can have an understanding that just because you add a lot of housing units may not necessarily mean that you're adding students um, to the public school system. So helping people understand how the built environment is changing and how they can make uh, adjustments to the infrastructure and the amenities that they provide that are obviously the key fabrics to all of our communities um, that we support um, that sort of work um, as well. So I will say a big thank you for listening to all of that. Take a deep breath. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. If there's something that you heard that you want more of for this board, say it out loud. My email is in the agenda, so is Doug's. If you heard something that you're like, I just want to know for my own community, uh, please send us a note. We're happy to come and talk to you and, and share this sort of more of than just the tip of the iceberg um, that I uh, spent time describing to you this evening. So again, thank you for your attention. Happy to chat, take questions, all those sorts of things. Just remember, that was the high-level version. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> look at look at my notes. I don't. I didn't even look at them. Yeah, Mr. Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Brad, can you go back to uh, I, uh, your slide number fourteen? It's regarding oh. congestion report. And you have yep. two categories under vehicle and person. And the concern I have is certainly, and maybe explain a little bit, on the item number three of each of those two categories, we see an 83 and an 82 percent increase, and that's regarding delay. How did you, obviously I think it's probably easy somewhat to come up with population projection, but how did you look at that delay? Did you, did you look at projection for, are we going to have increased capacity? Did you look at is that because autonomous vehicles are going to increase congestion, or can can you give a little? Sure, I, I I will start, and maybe I'll tag Jacob if, or Doug if I flub it horrendously. It's really the result of our travel model work. That's one of the things that we we use technology tools and data tr to try to understand the land use future of our region and the travel future of our region, and that travel future includes all the assumptions about the types of projects that are going to be built, when they're going to be built, how they're going to serve. Uh, the public, and even with those uh, planned improvements, you see uh, this type of increase uh, in delay. Uh, in fact, when you when you all set the measures related to delay in the in the MetroVision plan, that was a hard one for us to describe. What we were saying is, let's set a target that's less worse uh, than we than we inspect expect. Every other every other target was ambitious, and let's really sort of cut this in half or or whatever. Um, a lot of those were simply recognizing that with limited funding, growth in the region, uh, we are going to be dealing with dealing with a more congested future. Is there a way through technology, additional um, investments, and all those sorts of things to ultimately lessen uh, that congestion going forward? You're a man of good news. Yeah. <laughs> You're <laughs> welcome. You, maybe you could eliminate that one until the rest of us are out of office. <laughs> <Yeah. down here. laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, so maybe continuing on this discussion, um, the, the slide where you had the vehicle miles traveled saved um, from the different programs, uh, I think it was 19 million. Yes. So one, I, I am a user of the school carpooling oh, cool. and um, saved my life. So thank you for that. And what is 19 million? Is that 1% savings, 10% savings compared to overall? Can you give me a sense of how big of an impact this do you remember, Jacob, if, the, if there would have been a total VMT in the previous in the slide I just showed? So there's your average total annual total is 21 billion. Uh, so average weekday is uh, 62 million. 
just so not to get too technical, um, in our congestion report, we, we look at a little bit of a subset of our entire travel model. We look at kind of the major roads in our model. I think the number in our uh, travel model, and it's in our long-range plan, I think the number is 82 million uh, for 2015 for our current BMT, and that's going to go up in 2040 based on our model projection to 111 million. Um, and again, it's something we wrestle with um, of how much growth we're going to add in this region. And we know that congestion is going to get worse. VMT is going to go up. Um, and that's why we look at, you know, both total VMT, but also, you know, VMT per capita. Can we at least on, on a per capita basis, you know, move the needle a little bit? So what's the percent? You can't just... So, so is that a savings of 1% in vehicle miles traveled or? I'd have, uh, so, and Jacob quoted you a daily, a daily yes. number, mm -hmm. and that's an annual savings. Okay. So just, yeah. yeah. We, we will come back with the math. Thank you. Rather than. <laughs> Other questions or comments on uh, Mr. Calvert's presentation? Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Mr. Rieger. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for hanging in there. This is the last sort of major presentation of the evening. Uh, I'll endeavor to be relatively quick, but do want to cover this material a little bit different, um, although related to a lot of topics we've talked about this evening. Um, wanted to give you an update on a state commission known as the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. Um, and just sort of, you know, just talking about my role here a little bit in, in making this presentation. Uh, for the new board members, I'm Dr. Cog's Long Range Transportation Planning Manager. I'm also Vice Chair of this commission, so you get a little bit of a two for tonight. But I do want to recognize we have at least one other commission member in the room, which is Bill Van Meter from RTD. Uh, <laughs> Bill, I was going to have you make the presentation, but... Um, <laughs> Um, so you'll get a twofer for most of the presentation, but I do want to draw a distinction between those two roles at the end of the presentation. So um, we wanted, as I said, to give you an update on, on what this commission's been up to since Dr. Cog is on the commission. This commission's existed in some form for several years, uh, dealing with the Amtrak Southwest Chief Service in Southeast Colorado. And in the interest of time, I won't go into that tonight. What I will get into is that in last year's legislative session, the state legislature reconstituted what was the uh, Southwest Chief Commission and reconstituted it to the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. And in doing so, you know, it obviously added this, this additional mission of facilitating the development of Front Range Passenger Rail. And it gave us a deadline in the legislation directly that said, um, you know, report back to the legislature by December 1st um, about facilitating the development of Front Range Passenger Rail. And that's really what the legislation said. It wasn't any more specific than that. So we had about four months, uh, so no time, no money, um, and somewhat of a vague mission, but um, we, you know, we gave it the old college try. Um, we did report to the legislature on December 1st, and this presentation is really just a summary of, of kind of what we, the materials that we developed and what we reported to, uh, to the legislature. I do want to make clear, though, in saying that deadline, that the commission itself, you know, continues on. That was a deadline, you know, in our work, but the commission itself continues on. Uh, we have that sort of statutory authorization from the state legislature. Uh, we have the authority to receive and expend funds that we don't really have any uh, to expend. Um, but the commission sort of continues. We have our, our legislature are enabling legislation, but we did have this deadline to respond to. Um, so some highlights, and I'll just sort of get right to the punchline here. You know, I just said, you know, we have our enabling legislation. We didn't need legislation. What we frankly told the legislature bottom line is that, you know, if if you believe in this and if you want to, and I'm not personally opining on it here tonight, uh, but simply saying to the legislature, look, if you believe in this, if you want a front range passenger rail system as you've directed us uh, through your legislation and through the commission, you know, it's going to take a lot of steps and it's frankly going to take a lot of money. And we wanted in the very limited time that we had to at least set the table for the legislature to help them understand, you know, what would go into, what would it really take to navigate through the various steps that you've got to go through in the project development process. What are the things you have to do and at least some ballpark of what that might cost and, and how long it might take to step through all this. Um, there are several attachments in your packet that kind of summarize um, you know, the materials that we actually gave to the legislature on December 1st. Um, so this table is actually a, a, even more of a summary of one of those attachments. Really, we broke this into five 
you know, hopefully easy, under, easy to understand phases of the project development process, and I'll get into a couple of these uh, in a couple slides. But basically, it's really starting with defining that service vision with the public. We felt that was the most important thing. You know, what are we trying to accomplish? Who are we trying to serve? What is the problem that we're trying to solve? And particularly in transit planning, you know, people will say, you know, I want a bus or I want a train. Well, it's not, it's not so much the technology, it's what problem are you trying to solve, and then what's the thing that will help you solve it? Um, so we thought that was most important. And then from there, you can talk about things like forming a governing authority, who's going to operate and manage this, um, you know, going through the federal project development process, which we all know there's a lot of steps, you know, final design and construction and so on. Um, one of the things we gave the legislature was this map and, you know, wanted to make a couple points with this map. Number one for the legislature is that, you know, in this audience I, I can emphasize Metro Denver and I'm, and I'm glad to do that. But in every other audience that I make this presentation to, you know, we wanted to make the point that it's not just Metro Denver. This really is a statewide effort. And in fact, the legislation referred to the Front Range as really the entirety of the Front Range throughout the state of Colorado. We really are looking from Trinidad all the way up to Greeley and Fort Collins. And in fact, at a recent commission meeting, we actually had a delegation from uh, Cheyenne. Uh, we had the mayor of Cheyenne, we had a state legislature, state legislator from Wyoming, we had someone from Wyoming DOT, uh, we had a county commissioner from um, uh, Laramie County and Cheyenne. I mean, they were really interested in this. Uh, we, we deputized them as, as honorary members of the commission. Uh, we've also talked about reaching out to New Mexico. So this really is an interregional and even interstate sort of effort. Um, and we wanted the legislature to understand that this isn't just Metro Denver, this really is the state. Um, we also wanted the legislature to understand that, um, you know, that perception that something like this, a rail system, you know, it's really just for Metro Denver, it's for the urban folks, doesn't help the rest of the state. We wanted to make the point that, you know, when you're, when you're looking at this sort of cross-state connection, that there are a lot of things that will feed into this, that will support this, you know, whether it's Amtrak services that exist, CDOT's bus staying service, um, other inner city services that, you know, if you live in Gunnison, if you live in Steamboat, um, if you live in uh, Lyman or other areas around the state, you know, you can connect to this and you can have some benefit from it. Um, so we um, defined for the legislature, you know, sort of the major sort of issues to consider in going through this process. And I'm not going to go through these uh, tonight in the interest of time, but I think most of these are not you know, really any surprise, everything from public engagement to technology, alignment, governance structure, the regulatory environment, you know, all these things that you need to consider um, in a major public works project like this. And we probably could have had double the topics on, on this slide. And for the legislature and in the materials that we gave you in your packet, uh, we at least did a summary of kind of each of these to help them understand both what these mean and, and what sorts of major highlights you need to consider um, on each of these issues as you step through this. So the commission made the request to the General Assembly uh, on December 1st. Um, as I said, it's really a funding request, you know, bottom line. If you're going to do this, it takes time, it takes money. So we asked for funding for the first project phase, which we defined as roughly, you know, 8.7 million over three years, so that's 2.9 million a year. Um, as I've emphasized already, we felt it was, you know, top priority to, to do this. If you're going to engage in this, you really need to start with public and stakeholder engagement throughout the front range. You know, what are those mobility needs? Who will be served by this? Um, and define and confirm the vision for front range passenger rail. And from there, then you can start talking about a service development plan. Um, you know, what's that preferred alignment or route? You know, service and operating characteristics. Is it all day? Is it commuter oriented? You know, what technology is it? Is it high speed? Is it, you know, sort of like RTD? Uh, commuter rail, is it something else? You know, who's the operator? You know, you can see all the issues on this slide. But it's really starting to answer some of those questions first based on that public and stakeholder vision throughout the front range. Um, and then you can start doing things like, okay, how much is this really going to cost and how are we going to pay for it? Um, we also said to the legislature that if you're really going to do this, um, just like with mobility choice and some of these other efforts that we've talked about, you know, we're going to need to staff up. Right now the commission is basically, you know, volunteer time from folks like me and Bill Van Meter, um, other folks on the commission. Uh, I should, by the way, I said this in your memo, but I didn't say it verbally in the presentation, just who's on this commission. Uh, so let me touch on that. Um, it was the folks who were involved in the Southwest Chief uh, when it was the Southwest Chief Commission. But what got added to the commission with, um, with this new mission of front range passenger rail was all of the front range MPOs. 
Uh, so us and, and our, our sister agencies, Pikes Peak, uh, North Front Range, uh, Pueblo, um, RTD, obviously, Bill Van Meter's on the commission, uh, BNSF and Union Pacific Railroads are on the commission. Uh, CDOT staff has helped support the commission. So that was the commission's request to, uh, to the General Assembly. I will tell you that uh, we've had some sort of briefings and meetings um, as we've worked uh, through the legislative session, um, but we'll see where that goes. Um, the commission also had a request to each of the member agencies of the commission, so not just Dr. Cog, but every member agency. Um, and this is where I'm going to take off my commission hat and just put on my Dr. Cog hat. Um, uh, so the commission asked each of its member agencies to consider a resolution of support for the commission's proposed multi-phase project implementation approach that I've highlighted for you, um, as well as you know supporting uh, the commission's request to the legislature uh, for that you know phase one piece of the work to get this started. Um, that's not my role to to come here and ask you for that. Tonight's item, in fact, is just an informational item. We just wanted to update you. Uh, and brief you on what the commission has been up to. Um, but I do say I wanted to take your temperature and at least gauge from you sort of your interest in this and whether you want uh, sort of a subsequent presentation on this. And if you do, um, our commission is a mix of both staff people like me and Bill Van Meter, uh, as well as elected officials. And if you want a presentation addressing what's on this slide at a future meeting, we'll have one of the political folks do that. That's not our role as staff. Uh, so I just wanted to say that in this presentation. So with that, um, that's all I had, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any comments or questions from anyone? Mr. Van Meter. A comment, just a compliment for Vice Chair Rieger. He has um, downplayed his own participation, but he has taken a real leadership role on the commission and put a lot of time and energy into supporting the mission's the commission's work, the commission's mission. And so I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I didn't have that level of commitment, although I've been fairly heavily involved. Thanks, Bill. Bill is overly kind. I was just curious, what are the chances that the state legislature are going to accept the commission recommendations and find that level of money? Do you have a sense? Well, let's see. Um, let me think about the right way to answer that question. <laughs> Maybe you just did. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'll, I'll, I'll just be frank. I'll give you an honest answer. Um, the, we, we, formed our, uh, we formed our request to the General Assembly as a budget request. You know, as I said, we have our enabling legislation. We don't need, we don't need an, to run another bill through the legislature. That's not what we need. Uh, what we need is a budget request. Um, I will tell you that we have met with the governor. Uh, we've met with the president of the Senate, and we've met with the Speaker of the House to give a, a version of this presentation and talk about it. But it's basically going to depend on you know, the two or three or four different channels in which something like this could work its way into the budget. And that does remain to be seen. So I can't really put odds on that. What I can say is that, you know, it's, it's really through the budgeting process of the state legislature. And that may not be known until, you know, close to the end of the legislative session. Other comments or questions? Again, there's no action required. Uh, Mr. Rieger, anything else? Yeah, I guess if I just, you know, sort of pointedly ask the question, do you want a um, sort of subsequent presentation from a politician on the commission about uh, the information on this slide? Do you want to give me any direction on that? Is there any uh, request for a, a second presentation, a little bit more detail, uh, maybe from the political side on this? If, if you are interested in it, please raise your hand, and then we'll see how many people desire to have it. I've got about seven that are interested. Those that are not interested in another presentation at this time. I, I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Aaron. So it, would this presentation be just another informational one, or would it be uh, leading up to the possibility of a resolution of support? It would potentially be the latter. Okay. Then I'll raise my hand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I have a question. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Abel. Uh, thank you. Did, did you do any uh, analysis on about how many people would be writing this? Um, that's a good question, uh, Director. <laughs> Short answer is no, only because, you know, in four months we didn't really have a lot of time to delve into numbers or quantitative analysis. I mean, we sort of panicked and, you know, did the best that we could in the four months that we had even to get to this point. But one thing that we made clear to the legislature is that, you know, going forward it's things like that that really need to be determined. Sure. You know, alignment, technology, service yeah. levels, you know, all those sorts of things will play into that. So we wanted to help them understand, you know, that's one of many key pieces is the next step. Absolutely. Well, well I think, you know, we just need to, 
I, I know we can't get an exact number, but we really need to be careful um, that we're not over subsidizing it and that it at one point is going to, uh, you know, pay for itself. Other comments, Mr. Pfeiffer? I like the idea. Love. I think it's something we need. But I would say before you go in front of uh, the state and ask for money, you got to have some of those facts ironed out. Um, I, I'm not a fan of just the information's good. I don't think we need any more until uh, this this concept is baked a little bit more for us. Okay. Mr. Teal. Isn't that the point? Yeah, I'd like to. I kind of like to double down on Director Pfeiffer on that one, just because. Uh, I think we just need uh, need to let it develop a little bit more. You get a little further down in the phase, um, then that would probably be a good time to come back and l let us know where the benefits are for the region um, with with some more facts and figures behind it. I'd be happy to hear something then. Ms. Jones. I um, hear what the last two speakers are saying, but isn't the first phase a part of collecting the data that would answer those questions? Yes. And so I don't, I don't think we, this thing won't move forward if we don't actually fund a modest level of outreach and engagement and data collection and plan development so that we know whether or not it's viable and what the ridership would be and what the level of interest is, et cetera, and so forth. Okay, so, well, I didn't understand it that way, but so you're saying you need $8.7 million to just figure out the facts? Yeah, that's that's precisely right. So going back to this slide, that really is the point that, you know, to do that basic level of public involvement, stakeholder involvement, and really, you know, service development plan, ridership, and those sorts of things, and again, scaling this up, we're doing this across the entire front range. Yes, that what is that is what that first phase request to the leg legislature is. All right. Ms. Peck? Thank you. When I, uh, when I look at the North Denver Metro potential alignment options in there, some of those compete with uh, the RTD Fast Tracks option. Is this going to be a replacement of Fast Tracks because it looks like it's competing in some areas? Yeah, that's a really good question, um, and maybe I can even defer to Bill. But just in simple terms, no, it's not. It's not meant to compete or replace anything, and that's one of the you know several alignment questions to figure out is sort of that relationship and interop interoperability uh, with RTD system in Metro Denver. And there's some alignment questions in other parts of the state as well. And I don't know if you want to add to that, Bill. Go ahead, Bill. Please, Mr. Chair. Yeah, no. Um, a couple points from RTD's perspective. One. The system needs to be complementary, not competitive to the investment the region has made in fast tracks. And two, we have a commitment in fast tracks that's not completed and uh, there would be no intent, um, none that I've heard from any of my board members and um, nor coming from staff to have it any sort of front range system replace the fast tracks quarters or commitments. So complementary, not competitive, and not a replacement. Other comments, Mr. Rakowski? This is a legacy item. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, we're setting a foundation for what's going to happen then. The demographics are changing, not only in age, but in, in economic factors. And if you want to move people from north to south that maybe can't drive or can't afford Uber, this is a way that will happen. And recognize, too, the Cheyenne piece, I think, was very, very significant in that Wyoming is looking to remedy a mistake that was made in the 1800s called the Transcontinental Railroad. It went through Cheyenne, Cheyenne not through Denver. We connected. Now they understand they've got to connect more. That's what this is about. Ms. Maurer. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. But if you were to come back and bring more information about this, um, what would you be able to add to what you've presented today? I think the distinction I want to make here, and let me come back to that last slide, is, you know, so we presented the information that we gave to the legislature and kind of that first uh, piece of work that was due by December 1st. And as I said, the commission will continue um, and we'll, you know, we'll continue to um, 
uh, to do our, our function as a commission. But so we've given you the information that we have available today. So it's not so much presenting new information. It's the line that I do want to draw now between the two hats I'm wearing. I don't believe it's appropriate for me as a staff member to come to you asking you for um, resolution of support for the things that are on the slide. So really my question to you is that if I piqued your interest in this and you, you want to hear that, um, I would have a, a political member, frankly, of the commission come and do that at a future board meeting. But that's not our role as staff. So I think the question before us tonight is do we want to proceed on, let the commission continue to do their work, and if there is a request for that motion or support from the Dr. Cog board that they would come back in a formal meeting as an agenda item to request that support. If that's okay, then I would ask you to consider let's let them move on and then when they're ready they can come back as an agenda item in the future. Is that okay? All right. I think you got it, Jake. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to committee reports. Mr. Van Meter, you've been very helpful tonight, so we're going to start at the bottom of the list and let you go first. All right. Well, that's a twist. I've got a couple quick um, progress and related pain issues to talk about related to fast tracks. So progress on the end line is impacting four times in the coming weeks and months, the University of Colorado A-Line operations. We need to tie in near Denver Union Station, the North Metro or N-Line into um, Denver Union Station. It's going to require weekend closures between in, um, stations on the University of Colorado A-Line. So making progress on the North Line is going to impact the University of Colorado A-Line service particularly relevant this Saturday from 3 a.m. in the morning till Monday at 3 a.m. in the morning. We will be not operating University of Colorado A-Line between Union Station and Central Park Station. Instead, we will have a bus bridge carrying people between those stations and then rail operations from Central Park out to Denver International Airport, DEN. So in order to accommodate North Metro construction, we have to have four two-day weekend shutdowns spread out over the coming months of the University of Colorado A-Line. That's so we can tie track in to Union Station and make systems and electrification work. Similarly, the Southeast Rail Extension, we have a shutdown coming in March, March 16th through the 26th. It's longer shutdown of the last two stations on the southeast rail line, Lincoln and County Line. That's to accommodate similar work, track and electrical and systems tie-ins for the new southeast rail extension into our existing light rail system. So for that 10-day period, which coincides with many schools' spring break, timed that way on purpose, also timed to accommodate construction on C-470 and the express lanes at the same time, um, th th that shutdown is going to shut down two stations. Good news is that we will be able to provide a bus bridge there as well. There had been some concern and, uh, um, among stakeholders and among RTD board members and staff that we might not be able to do that because of operator shortages. We've been able to work out um, a way to get that accomplished, so that's good news. In other words, between those two stations, Lincoln and County Line, between March 16th and 26th, we'll have bus bridges to carry patrons between those stations instead of light rail, and also some additional parking at upstream stations. So, making progress on the N-Line and the Southeast Rail Extension uh, with some short-term pain. That concludes my report. Okay, Mr. Van Meter, one other item. Have you had your law judge meeting yet? Yes, that was held. That's um, pertaining to operations on the University of Colorado A-Line and by relation and inference also on the G-Line. Um, the administrative law judge hearing was last week, and we're waiting a um, uh, recommendation from that ALJ to the PUC. Okay, thank you. For those communities affected by this, please try to get word out to your residents as much as you can about the sh shutdown so that they're not surprised. Mr. Rinkowski. Two 
important uh, personnel changes at E-470. The mentor of John Dyack, Josh Martin, has left and was a great chair. And a former person that sat at this table, Heidi Williams, has taken over as the new chair. I expect her to be equal to Mr. Martin's wonderful performance. That's all I have. Okay. Mr. Rex, Rack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mentioned two things. Uh, we had a conversation with um, EPA's regional administrator at that meeting. We had a great conversation, a good, good dialogue back and forth. But more importantly, um, Ken Lloyd, who is the executive director of RAC, who is the only executive director they've ever known, announced his retirement. He, well, he announced that he will be retiring this summer. So uh, date, date is not certain yet, but uh, that was indeed big news. Um, so we wish Ken all the best. And yes, in regards to that, a search committee has been formed for the start of a search for a new executive director. I'm one of the members of that group. Uh, we will be having our first meeting in about uh, two weeks to start to figure out how we're going to go through that process. I'm also on that that group as well. Okay. So I don't know. I don't know who all was on it, but I know that that's out there. Thanks, Ms. Sanchez Warren. Okay. If you would please. Good evening. Uh, so there's a new member of the governor's cabinet. It's the senior advisory advisor on aging. His name's Wade Buchanan. He came and talked to the uh, advisory committee on aging, talking about what his job is and what he hopes to do. Uh, and in this first year, while well, he's here, uh, and then it, he has the option of getting uh, reappointed if the new governor wants him. Uh, to be there. So he's hoping to accomplish a few <laughs> big things to show that his position is valuable um, and uh, working with Dr. Cog on that to uh, make something happen. Uh, we talked about transportation. It's going to be another priority for us in the Area Agency on Aging again this year, uh, talking about some new opportunities, some new funding that's coming, um, and really trying to move the needle. Uh, we've never had uh, this in in my career where there's interest from multiple people because we tend to work in our silos right C dot works in their silos and and Dr. Cog works in our silos at least when it comes to aging um, and human services works in their silos and now people are really wanting to work together and there's peaked interest and the strategic action planning group on aging uh, is pri prioritizing transportation for seniors and people with disabilities and there's also money, <laughs> which makes a big difference. So we're really hoping to be able to, to move the needle. I did an update on federal dollars. <laughs> so we got a budget passed, right? But that didn't mean for, for 18 and then 19, but they didn't put the dollar amounts in there. So they've been working on that. Um, and they have until March 23rd to fill in the line items of the budget. So we're watching very closely what those line items look at uh, look like right now. We're watching uh, the president's proposed budget, what Senate is offering, what the House is offering. Um, there are some in 2000 or, or in 18. We look okay. It doesn't look like there's many cuts. It's in 2019 where we see more dramatic cuts in programs like our ship program being um, zeroed out. The Senior Employment Program, the LEAP Energy Assistance Program, Elder Abuse Funding, Community Blocks Service Grants, Community Development Service Grants, Human Service Block Grants, all being zeroed out. Um, so that's something to really watch. And, and if you're concerned about the impact on your community, please communicate with R Rich or I, and we'll, we'll talk about how we can uh, We'll give you the updated information and, and how we can advocate um, if, if, we, if we need to. And then Shannon Gimbel gave us a, a, an update on the closure of two assisted living facilities that happened last week. Um, they are, are called Nurturing Care. That's the name of them. There were four facilities. Uh, two of them were shut down last week very rapidly. Um, there was no nurturing going on and there was no caring going on, I guarantee you. Um, 
the ombudsman program was key in this because there they started getting complaints. They went out. They were the first to identify that there was a problem. In one building they showed up, there was no staff. The residents hadn't got their medications. There was a lady on hospice who hadn't gotten her pain medications. They hadn't been bathed. They hadn't had, I mean, there was no care going on. Our staff went out and visited all four facilities, identified two as a top priority, went to the health department. The health department came back and said, hey, you know, we're not going to be able to prioritize this. We're underwater. That's why we need that bill that Rich was talking about, um, getting more money for surveyors to go out in assisted living. And Shannon Gimbel uh, advocated strongly for about a weekend, communicating back and forth with a surveyor saying, you have to do this. You must do this. We have told you about this. And if someone dies, which they will, um, you're going to be held accountable. Uh, she had meetings with the health department, convinced them to go out. They went out said, oh my gosh, this is really bad. No kidding. Um, we also worked through other agencies that had their residents placed there. So Innovage had 22 residents placed in these two homes. And we told them they're not getting the care. They sent out nurses right away. Um, and our team went out to help find um, other homes for these folks. And we moved 40 people in two days um, to new homes. Uh, they're, they are awesome. The ombudsmen are awesome. And um, thank God for them, because I guarantee you, uh, especially the lady on hospice wouldn't have made it if it hadn't have been for them. That's my report. Mr. Partridge. Thank you, Ms. Chair. The MAC met in January in Denver, and Denver actually being the host. Mayor Hancock was in attendance. He talked about some of the large projects they have coming before them with their bond issue pass, mostly regarding transportation, uh, uh, drainage projects uh, and no doubt other infrastructure projects and also we talked about the opioid crisis the rest of the meeting focused on where the meetings will be held next five to six meetings what the agenda would be who would be the host and who would be the presenters that concludes the report okay miss jones um so the stack um spent a, a good chunk of its last meeting continuing talking about project lists um top priority is if there's a 2018 ballot initiative, what's the $6 billion -ish number of projects between that ballot initiative and Senate Bill 267 funds, what would be on that list? And I believe um, Doug sent that out to everybody so that you should be actively paying attention to that list, making sure it reflects your community's priorities because this conversation is underway. Um, uh, CDOT's also working on its big picture um, development program project list of major highway improvements and asset management and operations, and also the list of tr um, the transit component of that list. So I think um, there will be, for the next couple of months, outreach to communities about what should be on that list, particularly the transit list is not developed. So also an opportunity for Dr. Kagazabadi and individual jurisdictions to weigh in on that. Beyond that, um, we received an update on the National Highway Freight Program project selection process, what the criteria are, and um, have an opportunity to weigh in on specific projects for 2018. We approved the distribution of 5311 funds to rural transit agencies. Um, not so important to Dr. Cog, but to our, our fellow um, jurisdictions. And then, last but not least, we got an update on the risk and resiliency plan for I-70 and, and how to keep that corridor open during natural hazards and that kind of thing. So that's it. Hey, thank you, ma'am. Uh, to follow up kind of what Elise was talking about, uh, from CDOT perspective, there are a number of regional meetings going on. They're called 4Ps. Those are being done by county. Uh, make sure that your county and your municipalities uh, take advantage of those. Deborah, your groups are spearheading those everywhere. So when you get notice of those, make sure you're able to attend or send someone. Ron? Repo County just had theirs. Mr. Rieger was a superstar. Okay. I know that uh, Jefferson County has one coming up in about next week, and we also have one in Adams County uh, next week as well. From Metro Mayors, uh, we got to see the same presentation you saw at the beginning of the, uh, tonight.
for the Metro mayors. Uh, the other part that we spent a big part of our time on were the pending legislative um, bills that are being proposed by the private groups. Right now they're down to four, one, two, three, four bill titles, two at a half cent, one at point six two, and one at one. Uh, they're going through the titling process. They expect that they will have a lawsuit filed against one or more of those. They're trying to get ready, prepared for that. They will at some point settle on probably one bill going forward. Uh, we'll have to see where they end up. There's support going all over the place. So that decision is not made. It's still being talked about. But that is privately funded. The dollar value of the petitioning process is somewhere between 8 and $9 million that will be privately funded. So stay tuned. Uh, make sure your mayors get the information to you if you're not one of the ones attending the meetings. Last item before we adjourn, I want to thank Bob Roth for his uh, past year as our chair and the work he has done. Next meeting is March the 21st. We hope you all have a safe trip home. Be safe, and we'll see you all then. Thank you, and good evening.